Alrighty, time being 6.01, depending on what clock you look at, because it does say 5.36 here, nothing to see here, staff. Um, can I start by acknowledging the traditional Aboriginal owners? I'd like to start today's proceedings of Elders past and present, and are there any Aboriginal people that may be present? And can I express my gratitude that we share this land today and my sorrow for the cost of that sharing? And I do hope that in the spirit of reconciliation, we can move forward to a place of justice, to a place of healing and partnership as we walk gently together on this land. Um, councillors, note that Councillor Sarah Grattan is online and we need to move a resolution um, to have her join us formally so she can contribute to the meeting. Uh, and we have uh, a late note from Councillor Sprott who says he'll be here sometime from 8pm. All right. Councillor Bingham, you've got to, obviously had to move it. Yes, I'd like to move that Councillor Grattan be allowed in the meeting. Great. Do I have a second? Thank you, Councillor Crevelin. Right. Now, Sarah, are you looking at me? Or did we, do you really want to be part of this? <laughs> All right. Well, that's in favour to, to that councillor. Yep, Grattan in. Thank you. No one against? You sure, Sarah? Welcome to the meeting, Sarah. All righty. Item three point... Oh, sorry, I need to go through these. Just we go through item three first, just in relation to uh, 3.1 and 3.2, which are the ordinary minutes. So starting with 3.1, any questions, comments for the minutes? Moved and seconded by Councillor Nagy Robins. Thank you, Councillor Hines. All those in favour? Nobody against? Declare that carried. 3.2, the extraordinary meeting minutes. Any questions, comments? Do I have a mover and a seconder? Thanks, Councillor Crevelin. Thank you, Councillor Ryburn. Questions, comments? No. Then we'll move that forward as also. All those in favour? Nobody against? Declare that carried. Disclosures of interest going around. Any disclosures of interest? Councillor Gensher. Uh, Microphone, please. Uh, declaring 12.1 and not specific non-pecuniary interest. Reason being? Excuse me? Oh, that's it on the screen there. You need to read that out. Ah. I, I I've known Dan Maurice, an employee of Henroth Proprietary Limited personally uh, for over 25 years. No problems. Now, in line with the... Uh, sorry, we've got Councillor Glanville. Um, I have a pecuniary interest in relation to item 18.7. Um, as disclosed on my last return, I own a small amount of shares in High Street to My Street or Bundle Fresh, a local business which home delivers groceries from local retailers in the Northern Beaches area. Um, I will manage that conflict by stepping out of the room for that when that motion is decided. Not a problem. Thank you, Councillor Glenville. Okay, and just in accordance with the Code of Meeting Practice, um, councils are reminded of their ethical obligations. And also the disclosure of interest in accordance with Part 17 of the Code of Many Practice, all councillors must disclose and manage any conflicts of interest that may have been matters being considered in, um, in accordance with 4.25 and 4.26 of the Code of Conduct. Uh, returns made by councillors designated persons must be tabled at council's meeting and published on council's website. Table tonight, we have 17 first returns, one annual return and one change return from designated persons. There we go. Thank you. We now move on to public forum and address. And can I just remind those in the gallery that we do not film. Um, we have rules against filming uh, without permission, express permission of council. So those of you um, who may wish to film, please do not. Uh, and then we have other rules and guidelines around public forum and address, which is simply that the meeting is being broadcast over the internet. Speakers must agree to the following before being permitted to address the council. That is, you will not disrupt the conduct of the meeting and will treat people with respect and courtesy. They will not denigrate or make defamatory or personal attacks on myself, councillors or staff. And the council accepts no responsibility for comments made by you speaking at public forum and public address that could the council lead to a claim of defamation by any person either in the public gallery, viewing the meeting via the internet or through the media that your name and subject of the address will be made public in the minutes of the meeting and on the recording. If you're okay with that, um, I'll invite you to speak for up to three minutes at the lectern there. Uh, there's a microphone, there's little two buttons there. When you see the red light come on, that means the microphone is on. 
take a deep breath and we're ready when you're ready. And you'll get a little 30 second warning bell to wrap up at two minutes 30. Okay. What's up, Mr. Smith? No? All right. First speaker for this evening, we have seven speakers on in public forum, followed by approximately the same amount for public address. So, speaker number one, Mark Horton, in-person provisions for art displays in Motorvale. Mark, you've done this before. Leave it in your capable hands. Just the microphone. I gave you a wrap and everything, said so you've done this before. Thank you. I'm here. Good evening, councillors. I'm speaking on behalf of Friends of Manavale. We'd like to see more permanent displays of public art in the Manavale village or along the beach frontiers. Um, these permanent arts pieces should be located in busy areas that are frequented by the public, not some out of the way headland that's only visited by a few. In 2014, I participated in the Alive and Pitwater program organised by the former Pitwater Council. The objective of the program was to enliven Pitwater villages through, among other things, displays of public art and cultural events. One piece of art placed on display by Pitwater Council as part of the enlivenment program was a wordplay sculpture with the words imagine, but with the second eye missing. It stood for a number of years outside the Manavale Library. Public art such as this work was explained as being great to bring to life our walkways, landways, laneways and public domains to spark the imagination and create community conversations. Um, I also wish to remind Council of a promise some time back that a permanent creative art space would be established in Monavale. There is currently a temporary street front creative art space located in Park Street beside the Monavale Library comprises a number of rooms that are rented out to artists and display, to display and sell their artworks. The upstairs meeting room in Park Street has been used for a number of recent exhibitions, but to the best of my knowledge, this space is made available only at the artist's expense. Now, last week I spoke to a local artist who some time back was appointed to a working group tasked with determining the appropriate place for a Marnival art space. He said that nothing had progressed beyond council making available the temporary spaces I've already mentioned. The working group identified the upstairs council offices and rooms in Park Street as being the best place for a permanent gallery, art space and workshop. I believe that council customer service centre, which occupies that space, could be more, more appropriately placed at the street level in Park Street, where it would be more accessible to the public. I call on councillors to consider such an arrangement. Without appropriate displays of art, our community is boring, sterile and colourless place. Pitwater Council failed to deliver art in the Monoval um, despite the promises in its enlivened Pitwater program, but I'm hoping this council will deliver. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, just to give you an update on that, the creative space at Monoval, my understanding is we haven't necessarily put on a hold as part of the, the broader discussion about the Monoval Place Plan. So I think that's where it might have potentially stalled to your point. So I think that's been, we we'll to make sure it's part of the whole plan for Monoval Place Plan so we can get an update on where that is. And we did do Avalon instead of Monoval first, but Monoval because we want to do the place plan and make a part of that. So that's where it's at. So, but good points about the other stuff. Thank you. Um, conservation zones, uh, Chrissy Lee. Are you here, Chrissy? There we go. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Chrisha Lee, and my I'm talking to you about this uh, brochure that you have here. Um, I'm talking in relation to 65 Rignold Street and I have a submission in on the current conservation zone review on this property and the adjacent property to it, which is number number two. The, the land currently in, along the foreshore here and here is zoned C2. Uh, for some reason, this block 65 is zoned C3. I don't... Um, understand also why this block goes to the water and number two also goes to the water. They are the only two blocks that do so. If you have a look over the page, 
you can see um, on this map here, this is the wildlife corridor through Seaforth. Uh, the, in red is where 65 Rignold Street is. The wildlife corridor goes all the way through Seaforth, through this big chunk that is 65 and on to Garrigal National Park. Uh, if the 65 gets developed, th that wildlife corridor is completely chopped in half and it's not a corridor anymore. It's, a, it's just a block where cats and dogs get to feast on lots of native animals. It is also a riparian zone. I don't know why it's the only private riparian zone, but it is. And it is... Um, if you have a look on this map here, I've given you a, a larger picture. You can see the, the riparian zone and the riparian buffer zone take up all of number two, all of 60, one lot of 65, and a large section of the other lot that comprises 65. The developers will come through here and they will decimate this area. For the, the fines for chopping down the trees and stuff are just part of DA costs. And, and this zone will be blocked. This is the biodiversity corridor that goes through Seaforth. And I've, I've circled in black, black, black here on my map what, where that severs the wildlife corridor completely. The con uh, conservation zone route view, I believe, will not um, pass until 2024. It will be too late for this block. And uh, I, I'm begging council to consider changing the conservation status from a C3 to a C2 zone as a matter of urgency because it's an entire ecosystem. It's not just about saving a few tall trees. It's about saving the ground-dwelling threatened species that live there. On the brochure, I have given you a whole selection of the fauna that, and flora that I have observed there over the years. And I beg council that you give this zone, as a matter of urgency, a new conservation rating. Thanks. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. North, North Manly Squash Facility, Michelle, Michelle Martin. Thank you. Mr Mayor, councillors and fellow squashies, thank you for tonight. Um, I'm here, I'm Michelle Martin, and I'm a member of North Manly, North Manly Squash Centre. It is political season, isn't it? Firstly, I want to thank you all, all the councillors for listening to our squash community. Secondly, I want to warn you all that squash players have longevity, not only because it is a sport for life, but because we are fit, we are hanging in there for a long five-setter. It feels like we're still in the first game, so we've got a long way to go. Mr Mayor, I heard that you played squash, and you played squash with your children. Do I need to declare an interest? <laughs> no, I'd like you to listen. Stay, stay put, please. Always. Shame it is that you're not at North Manly. Your flyer here says that you're a candidate, you're coming, you know, into the... the political season to be elected. It reads in there that you have commitment to deliver for Wakehurst. A key point in there is upgrade, enhance our sporting and recreation facilities. You had the opportunity to upgrade the squash courts at North Manly back when the futsal courts went in. You had staff assessing the courts, looking at the ventilation, looking to open up the facility to modernise it. You ran out of money straight after the futsal courts went in. Funny that. Not sure what I should say because what we did get was artificial grass behind the squash courts. Really? It's not really what we need. I want to quote, I want to quote something else that has been, um, was said to me very on in, our, uh, in the process of our many meetings that we've had with council, and that's when I say many meetings we've had, New South Wales squash, with myself being part of it. One of your council staff said to me, Michelle, if you're not careful, you may not get anything. That's a strange way for delivering on a promise. Is this what we are up against, Mr Mayor? If we say too much, we might not get anything. Squash New South Wales have been trying, and I say trying, to work with you for months on a positive outcome for the sport. They are yet to see anything that gives them certainty over a new facility. And I say see, as many words have been spoken, and we're still not yet to see a visual plan. 
In fact, if it wasn't for New South Wales squash, you wouldn't have the grant funding that has been allocated to the Ruringa Recreation Centre, as they were the ones that, were, um, that informed you it was available. Why are you and, all, uh, and we still wasting so much time and energy and ratepayers' money on wages for staff having meetings and yet still no delivery? We have offered numerous options to make this site work for all, even with better outcomes for your current DA submission, sorry, for your DA master or your master plan. Mr Mayor, before you leave your position, you should deliver on that promise, a project for which the council has received funding, including a minimum of three squash courts. You are now, you've announced the DA for the golf club as part of the DA. You are demolishing the squash courts. I have players every week asking me what is happening to the squash courts. What is council doing? They're asking me at my local cafe. Can I ask you, all you councillors what you do for a sport? Do you go to the gym? Michelle. Do you go to the tennis courts? Michelle, your time's running out. I did give you an extension quickly. unofficially. Quickly, just quickly. Yeah, I just want to ask, if you've got that taken away from you, what would your mental and physical state be? Our squash players here play one, two, three, four times a week. Their mental health, their mental well-being will be disrupted. Please consider what is happening to our sport in the Northern Beaches. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Can I just ask the CEO just to comment on the update on where that's at at the moment? So could I just ask the CEO to give us a comment, please, on where that master plan is up to and the DA, as I understand there has been meetings and a lot of progress has been made? Yes, Mr Mayor, so the, the DA for the golf club is currently being assessed by the council staff, um, so I don't know a time when that will be um, brought to fruition. Um, I can confirm the council has committed and this council has committed to providing three squash courts um, at the North Manly site. And we made an opportunity available at Glenrose, I think, for two courts. And we've asked the state member for Manly in relation to North Head, where there are two courts there as well. I think, Mr Mayor, we've reached out to the operators at Glenrose and they said that there's some squash courts, squash courts there. We've also had meetings with the North Head, uh, North Harbour Trust, uh, sorry, the Harbour Trust, to see if we can um, um, put some money into um, fixing up the squash courts that are at North Head. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, could I please ask the CEO whether it's please possible that each councillor receive a written advice as to the specific issues raised by Michelle Martin OAM? Thank you, Councillor Delica. Yes, yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker for this evening is Peter Conroy in relation to the role of the council representing the views of its residents. Mr Mayor, I've got a handout here that uh, I'd like to circulate before I speak. I'll just ask the um, staff member next to you closest to grab that. Governance, if you want to take care of that at some stage. We can continue now to start speaking whilst that's being handed out. Mayor, councillors, thank you for the opportunity. I live at 56 Francis Street in Manly. Later you'll hear about the role of councillors diminished by the state government. But one role that has not been taken away from you is the role of setting the tone for the organisation, the standards, how council interacts with the wider community. These are the points I want to cover. Later you also hear about a development application that exceeded 12 provisions of the DCP that was refused by staff on two occasions, staff who had inspected the site and could not support the application due to issues of solar access, amenity, visual privacy, side and rear boundary setbacks, excessive bulk scale and mass. Following two refusals, an appeal was lodged in the Land and Environment Court by the applicants uh, totally within their rights and it was up until this point, everyone was working within the relevant framework. However, this is where things get very messy and where the tone, where the council's behaviour comes into question. The question is, did council act professionally and in good faith with all parties? In this regard, I'd like to share following four points with you. Point one, when an appeal is lodged, council staff are obliged to attempt to find a solution which is what happened on this occasion between the 19th and 30th of August. Staff and the applicant reached an agreement. 
the amazing thing is that staff were able to do so without ever inspecting the neighbouring properties, without seeing the site and context. Not even an experienced Land and Environment Court Commissioner can do that. They always start with a site meeting. Point two, once council staff and the applicants reach an agreed position, it becomes an academic exercise for others. The court is obliged to endorse the plans and objectors are out of the equation. They have no legal standing. Point three, on 31st of August, the neighbours were notified of the revised plans and a conciliation conference. Significantly, however, the notice made no mention of the agreed position council staff and the applicant had reached. Adjoining residents are given the impression that they can contribute to the process. This is essentially not the situation. The process is over for them. However, adjoining residents engage experts to assist them in a preparing a response to the revised plans, time and money that is wasted. They no longer have a say in the process. Point four, the matter goes to the Land and Environment Court, a site meeting. During the course of the meeting, neighbours alert the court to the fact that documents are demonstrably inadequate and council staff and the applicant admit they've reached their agreed position without personally inspecting the properties. Thank you for that. That's three minutes. There have been no further extensions of time. Thank you. Do you have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor DeLuca. We're now voting a procedural motion for an extension of time. Okay. Thank you. No. Just wait for that to be on screen. Okay. Those in favour? Councillor Walton, Councillor Bingham, Councillor Causey, Councillor Gedger, Councillor Amon, Councillor Dulu, Councillor Crevelin, Councillor Robins, and Councillor Ryburn declare that carried. All others against? Continue. Thank you. Then there is a sudden change of direction. The council officers and the applicant meet again during the course of the afternoon. They correct and update all of the inadequate documents. They revise the plans based on their new knowledge gained from the site inspection and reach a new agreed position to present to the court, all without any direct involvement of the neighbours. Successive requests for information are managed through a fog of legalese and piecemeal information. Ultimately, the applicant is approved and the application is approved exceeding more controls than either of the two previous refused applications. Neighbours feel that they have been misled, poorly represented by council and not afforded procedural fairness. Formal complaint is lodged and the response is nothing to see here. All good, everything is in order. So councillors, it's the reputation of your organisation that we're talking about here tonight. Did everyone act professionally and in good faith at all times? It's now up to you as to how you respond to these circumstances. Thank you. Moving on to Council Development Control Plan, Andrew Peterson. Good evening, Mayor, Councillors, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, the role of councils and individual councillors has been progressively diminished over the years and councillors have been expressly removed from activities such as determination of development applications. However, one important role that has not been taken away from council or councillors is the role of setting the strategic direction and policy of the council. One of the most important policy documents that the council presides over is the development control plan. The plan that establishes the look and amenity of neighbourhoods we all live in. The, D the council DCP is the last line of defence in the fight against overdevelopment and inappropriate development. The manner in which the DCP is applied and the consistency with which it is applied are key elements in its integrity and it's the ability to ward off bad development. I want to share with you an example of where this has not occurred. 
where in fact a total of 12 of Council's DPC, DCP controls have been exceeded and I have a handout to share with you. The approved development I am alerting you to exceeds the building height standard of 8.5 metres, exceeds the number of storeys control being three and not two, exceeds the wall height control by a minimum of one metre above a maximum of 7.2 metres, is non-compliant with side setback controls and is non-compliant with the rear setback prevailing control by seven to eight metres. In other words, the, net, the now approved three-storey building does not comply with any of the building envelope controls. The provisions of the DCP have not been upheld nor consistently applied and as such, and as a consequence, the integrity of your DCP has been undermined. From a community member's perspective, this raises questions over the probity of the, of the council's decision making. Consistent application of the DCP is the basis on which we make our objections to development and is our north star for what constitute reasonable development in our area. It is also the basis of which we hire experts to represent us. The undermining of the DCP is particularly evident in this example as the development was unanimously refused by two develop development de determination panels for the reasons outlined above. However, during a land and environment appeal, even worse development was put forward and approved. In the words of an independent planning consultant, quote, quite, quite strangely, in an appeal where the contentions are all about height, bulk, scale, and setbacks, the plans actually increase the building height, increase the floor space, and make no change to the side setback. The challenge I now put to you is not to look the other way, but to explore what really happened or what is really happening to the application of the DCP that you are responsible for setting. Was this just an isolated incident? And if it was, why? The issue is well documented with five sets of plans Thank being you, put to council, evaluate. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, Councillor Amor. Can I ask a question of Mr. Pedersen through you? Um, Mr. Pedersen, is this the same property that um, the previous speaker spoke about? So the Francis Street one? Okay, thank you. Yep, subject to two refusals and then the Prison Land Environment Court is what we're hearing. Okay, Councillor Bingham? <laughs> Sorry. Councillor Bingham? That's fine. Okay, thank you. Councillor Luca? Thank you. Just in relation to the uh, addresses by Mr. Conroy and Mr. Peterson that we have just heard, <clears throat> Is it please possible for the Director of Planning through you, um, Mr CEO, to address these issues or at least provide all councillors with a briefing note, particularly addressing where that complaint went? Was it internal to council or an external body? Uh, and whether the situation as presented to us um, is actually correct? And if so, uh, what would an outcome of a staff review be? Thank you. The court judgment, yes. Councillor, sorry, thank you, Councillor DeLuca, Mr CEO. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, so this matter has been investigated twice, um, uh, this particular matter. Um, we had a complaint from the applicant about um, council not uh, um, not being not following proper process. We had a complaint from the two neighbours about council not following proper process on that. The, uh, the process that was, that, uh, that was investigated uh, on both occasions um, we were satisfied that council followed the proper processes um, um, and we're not talking about the merits of it, that's a planning matter, but as far as the processes go, we were satisfied on both occasions that council followed the proper processes. Twice they refused the application, went to the Land Environment Court. Uh, at the Land Environment Court, the experts got together, which is one of council's planners, where they then came together, came to an agreement as per the, 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 uh, the court rules, the court processes and that, and then the, the commissioner decided to approve the application. Thank you. Amon. Sorry, just a further Council. question, Councillor Amon. So in relation to, and I quote, the experts getting together, both residents, Mr Conroy and Peterson, have raised concerns that they were not included in any of that discussion. Now, I'm aware of the court rules, but what is Council's approach in this regard, particularly considering our community consultation policy, is it normal for residents who have been appointed or asked to be witnesses on behalf of council and on behalf of their communities that they are shut out of such negotiations or is there any opportunity, particularly in the future, 
to include them in such liaison and negotiations before um, the, from what I take, a agreed position is then put to the court. Mr. CEO, yeah. Andrew, you may sit down. By the way. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And in response to the question that's posed, the practice of council is to seek to facilitate the involvement of the community so far as possible in the court process. Um, that will include the notification of residents about um, upcoming court dates. That will include, where possible, the provision of plans and amended plans as was provided in this case. Um, council expressly sought the applicant's permission to provide without prejudice amended plans to seek the input of residents in circumstances where those plans could not be provided to those residents as of right. Um, uh, those, whilst those plans may have come up in a court um, uh, expert joint conference process, um, council sought to ensure to the extent it could that those <coughs> plans were provided to residents following the conclusion of that process. Um, it is the obligation, well, it, it is um, set out in the court rules, particularly the court policy, that in undertaking a joint conference, experts should look to alternative solutions to seek to resolve the issues in dispute. That is what occurred on this occasion, and that is how those amended plans um, came before uh, or were generated by the applicant in the proceedings. Um, the other thing to note is that following the joint conference undertaken by the experts, there was no agreement of council um, to resolve the matter at that point in time. Council wished to obtain the input of residents to seek to identify whether any further issues remained before determining a position as to how to advance the matter. Um, that occurred at the first day of the hearing, oh, sorry, at the conciliation conference on the 19th, I believe it was, of September. Um, um, at which point all the parties were at the site. I also um, um, note that the part, that the the experts had inspected the site during the course of their joint conference and also prior. Um, as a result of the Section 34 conciliation conference process on the 19th, um, what occurred was that there was further amendments to the plans proposed by the applicant to seek to resolve issues that had been identified by, by um, objectors and um, as is contemplated in the court's processes, um, those amendments were put to council for consideration and there was a process followed um, which ultimately resulted in council's expert and the applicant's expert and the court being satisfied as to the plans that were before it. Thank you, Eskul. Councillor Raymond. Um, there was a, a judgment issued on this. Is it about seven pages. Is it usual that a judgment's issued where there's an ultimate agreement between the parties? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, it is. It's a requirement of the um, of Section 34 of the Land Environment Court, and um, on each occasion that the parties do agree uh, as to a proposed solution to a matter, the court must be satisfied that the uh, proposed decision, the agreement is a lawful one, and in that regard, the court must take into account all the jurisdictional prerequisites as to the granting of the consent. It did so on this occasion, and in doing so, it was also required to consider the merits of the proposal insofar as there was a uh, height exceedance proposed, contrary to the um, um, LEP, and in doing so, the court made various, well, accepted that there was environmental planning grounds for the contravention of um, those controls and, and noted in the course of that that it was an acceptable development and appropriate development and had was consistent with the... Uh, one moment. Must be our first meeting uh, back. ...presents a compatible height and scale to the surrounding development and, um, and met the objectives of the R1 zone also. Um, it, it, Thanks, I'll, I'll make a, a comment and then just ask a final question. It, it just seems interesting to me that um, council could have approved this development as was ultimately agreed without the need for a judgment. So it's just interesting that judgment's required. But what were our costs, our legal costs on this matter? And I appreciate you might need to take that on notice. 
Uh, I'd have to come back to you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. We have the next speaker on Manly Squash Courts, Jack Goodman. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Councillors. I'm here to uh, continue Michelle Martin's exceptional comments about the Squash Center. I'm the father of three squash playing children. In fact, my kids all grew up playing with Michelle's kids. Um, all of my children attended public high school just a few kilometers down the road here at Northern Beaches Secondary College at the Manly campus. We've all played at the Manly squash courts, even in their sadly dilapidated state. Uh, more importantly, our kids have coached extensively on the Manly courts, providing instruction to school groups from Manly, also Balgala Boys, and other schools across the Northern Beaches Council area. And I can say with confidence that when it has been offered, squash is one of the most popular sport offerings across the Northern Beaches Secondary College group of high schools. And that includes nearly 5,000 high school students. So I speak tonight to express great concern regarding the current state of council's plans to push ahead with building a new golf clubhouse without including a formal commitment to building a new squash and multi-sport center with a minimum of five squash courts. And I just want to make a point here. There was some mention of uh, some courts in Belrose. Um, those are not local courts. Uh, they are um, nowhere near the current location. And there certainly isn't any sense that the uh, other courts that might be up at um, North Head or at, um, it would be of equal value to what we're talking about with the Manly Squash Center. Um, this is in spite of the fact also that I understand that the Squash New South Wales has helped the council secure a federal grant of $3 million. So there's a squash community on the northern beaches that it seems the council is happy to ignore. And this is difficult to understand. It includes thousands of school children. Um, and the, the courts at Manly are now the only public courts, and I make that really clear, between Willoughby and Eleonora. There's upwards of half a million people across that geography. So I just don't understand how council thinks it would be fair to shut down these last three courts with 90 days notice and no formal commitment to any timeline to rebuild these court, these, these, this facility with the five courts that the community needs and that are co-funded by a state grant. It makes us all wonder if council's interested in the fundamental democratic principles of fairness and transparency. So what is driving this unilateral push for a new, a new clubhouse while the golf course has un uninterrupted access to their current clubhouse? And I'm sure it's not the case that the council is intending to act in, in a biased manner here or an unfair manner, but that is certainly how it looks from the outside. I encourage you in the strongest possible way to listen to your community, think deeply about the fundamental values of fairness and transparency, as well as the legacy you each wish to leave this community and to your own families, and do the right thing now and engage fully, transparently, and in good faith with the squash community. Let's work together to build a better, fairer community outcome for all stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. David Murray, predicting the future of pit water. Oh, sorry, Councillor Marano Perez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, look, uh, I thank all the squash people for turning up and, and giving us your comments. Uh, I do appreciate that. Um, I'm really not that worried about the number of courts in there because we have a commitment, and I personally gave that commitment a few years ago that we'll have a minimum of three courts there. But the question, Mr. Mayor, to you or the CEO, is that a few years ago I recall seeing some demountable squash courts being put up at uh, Martin Place in the city to advertise a World Cup, I think it was. My question to you, Mr. Mayor, and the CEO, is would it be possible to look at a location for some potential demountable courts mm -hmm. to be put together for the duration of the works that will go into that particular site. So, um, before, to correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Sia, but when we had the meeting with, C, with Squash New South Wales, with the other squash users, some have spoken tonight, that was brought up, that particular item, and we said, yes, we have space, and Squash New South Wales are going to look at potential for doing exactly what you just suggested. Is that not the case, that we had some, we agreed? I just need to check with the staff, Mr. Mayor, but I'll get back to you, Councillor. All right, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, and just look, Squash is going to drive that. Dave Murray, sorry, mate, where art thou? Predicting the future of pit water.
Thanks very much. Looks like I chose the right night to bring a prop. <laughs> well, I was cleaning out the kitchen cupboard recently and I came across this old teacup, which hasn't been washed since 2016. Back when the catch cries like fit for the future or scale and capacity were all the rage. Well, I don't fancy myself much as a fortune teller, but I thought I'd have a go at reading the tea leaves and what they said is what to predict pit water might change post amalgamation. Turns out tea leaves are a whole lot easier to understand than our new council logo. According to the leaves, a larger amalgamated council would require significantly more funding to secure a seat at your table. In other words, amalgamation would favour candidates backed by political parties or other vested interests. Spot on there, I'd say. Indeed, the leaves predict that the successful election campaign for council would be well out of the reach of many fine, outstanding citizens. Take Mr Mark Horton, for example. Over here, the leaves predict that the amalgamated council could be reduced to a training ground for political aspirants seeking higher office. It's a lot of tea leaves there. Must have been a double-strength brew. Seriously, all the rhetoric about scale and capacity, what was disappointing about the creation of this council is that Warringah already had the scale and capacity to dominate the two adjoining councils. Warringah had the scale and capacity to spend money on a campaign promoting a position which it favoured. And seven years on, the larger population at the centre of the peninsula has the scale and capacity to determine the agenda of this council. Pitwater has seen a weakening of our local representation and a dilution of the community involvement we previously enjoyed in our own reference groups, our own youth groups, and our own development of planning and visions for our area. Pitwater resident, residents continue to travel further to council meetings and then sit through lengthy and often quarrelsome debates about issues involving the far end of the LGA. There is considerably less of the agenda and precious meeting time devoted to Pitwater's local issues. It's a far cry from what we enjoyed with our own nine councillors in the Mona Vale Hall. <laughs> calls for more meetings, calls for more meetings or meetings at Mona Vale or even Pitwater mayoral portraits on the wall have fallen on deaf ears. I'll finish by saying that I recently saw the Mayor remind us that all of this change equates to a supposed saving of $29.5 million per year. Do the maths. For a population of 264,000 people, that equates to just $2.14 per person per week, which is less than a cup of tea every fortnight. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Lost the debate there. Councillor Hines, would you like to take over for the next portion? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Okay. Um, next on our items is... If I only could find it. Um, first of all... Public address, sorry about that, um, had a mental blank. Um, item 12.1, Daniel Morici. Morizzi, if you could come up, please, to the red light. Your three minutes if, starts from when you speak. If I can beg speak. your indulgence, Madam Chair, I think I'm Scott Barwick. I was down to speak um, with Dan. Um, if it's okay, I'll go first and Dan can conclude if that's acceptable. Yes, that's fine. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Councillors, my name's Scott Barwick from SJB Planning. Um, my firm prepared a planning proposal that has been lodged with Council and is the subject of the uh, report before you tonight. Um, I'm here to ask Councillors to not adopt the recommendation but allow the gateway process to do its work and do the further finessing of the, uh, the planning proposal and a consideration of the housing opportunities that it presents. The main issue I want to speak to is the, th the flavour of the report would give the councillors the um, indication that the proposal relies upon a shelter in place to deal with flood hazard. It's not the case. The case is that the proposal relies upon evacuation. The proposal has been designed to accommodate to the flood planning level plus climate change for the floor planning uh, for the floor levels. So it's the design level plus the allowance for uh, climate change. 
the mention of shelter in place is to allow the opportunity for the provision of second floor dwellings, because they're proposed to be two-storey dwellings, which would be above the PMF in the circumstances where that may arise, where people, residents, weren't evacuated or chose not to evacuate. Again, it's interesting that the flavour of the report in the SES seems to be that shelter in place is um, a non-existent process. Uh, councillors may be aware that today is in fact the last day of the public consultation on the Department of Planning and Environment's draft shelter in place guideline. It is a, a recognised uh, contribution to the management of flood risk. We're talking about an area that um, is liable to flood planning. The proposal has accommodated flood risk and flood planning. Um, it has proposed evacuation routes which are at the flood planning level plus climate change. And like all um, proposals, the desirable outcome is evacuation before, but the, the shelter in place is a safeguard opportunity that's there. There are some criticisms of the proposal in relation to environmental matters. We are more than willing to continue to work and, as I say, let the gateway process do its work to fine-tune those. It's not um, that the site is pristine. Yes, there are interface issues with the Warrywood wetlands um, that need to be appropriately managed and, as of course, they should be managed properly. But we are asking that the gateway process be allowed to do that and the finessing of the application and the proposal um, for a modest 40 or so dwellings be allowed to be considered in further detail uh, by the appropriate authorities, including the SES, including uh, environment and conservation. Um, that is it. If there are any questions, I'm available. But again, we'd ask that councillors allow the proposal to go through to Gateway and be further finessed. Thank you. OK, thank you, Scott. So next is Daniel coming up after you. Uh, thank you, councillors and Madam Chairman. Um, the Northern Beaches and greater, si greater Sydney are in a housing crisis. Almost every day, the impacts on our communities are headlines in the media. There is no end to this crisis in sight. There are not enough homes for downsizers, essential workers, our children and grandchildren. This proposal will assist all of these groups. Downsizers can move into the townhouses, freeing up their larger homes for young families. And 10% of the dwellings are proposed as affordable housing for 10 to 15 years. Brookvale is 10 kilometres away from Warriwood, as you would all know, and so we'll do little for housing supply in our local area. It's a very long and uncertain road regarding delivery and dwelling yields for Brookvale from a structure plan to a gazetted LEP to DA approval and then to delivery. The Warriwood Valley land release was conceived in 1997 and it will now deliver 251 less dwellings than predicted by 2030, over 33 years later. This typifies the problem across Sydney. The process is too slow and too uncertain. It will be many years before a single dwelling is built under the Brookvale Structure Plan, and many more before the projected dwelling yield is reached, if it is ever reached, based on the strategic track record. The department has asked for several urgent residential rezonings to be sent to Gateway by December 2020 if Ingleside failed. This is one of those foreshadowed rezonings, the only one that we know of, and it's only, as Scott said, for around 40 dwellings. The Gateway process exists as the next filter for proposals that are not 100% resolved, but have demonstrated sufficient merit to proceed. Councillors, I implore you to resolve to send this to Gateway, including if you see fit, specifically noting any flood evacuation concerns you may have. The SES will be formally consulted. If this proposal fails, then so be it. We'll be probably, we will lodge another commercial rezoning application in all likelihood that has no requirement for residential evacuation. If successful, it means the department and the SES will formally endorse our proposal and flood planning and that the council, based on the staff report in front of you, rightly raise questions about. This is perfectly reasonable. Council, I ask you, where is the risk for you sending this to Gateway? There is none. The only risk comes by refusing the proposal and delaying further assessment of new housing supply and in doing so, contributing to the housing crisis that is forcing our essential workers, our friends and our families 
out of their streets and the neighbourhoods that they grew up in. The risk is being seen by the community to be doing nothing and not even giving proposals like this a chance whilst the crisis deepens. I put to you councillors that the choice is obvious that you send this proposal for gateway assessment noting your specific concerns. I respectfully ask that council step up on housing supply for the people as their elected leaders push ahead with new supply and not perpetuate the problem in this growing and very real housing crisis Thank you, that touches us all. Your time's up. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Can, can I ask you a question of the CEO through you, Madam Acting Chair? Yes. <coughs> Yes. The, the speaker made reference to if we reject the, if we accept the staff recommendation, then they will do something absent us being involved, I, which I, I didn't follow that. But the understanding I had was that if we didn't do this, there was an or else, and the or else was some kind of unknown threat that they would progress it some other way, and that I, it, it was just wasn't clear to me what, what was meant. Sorry, through you, um, Deputy Mayor. Um, my understanding of that statement was that the applicant could pursue another planning proposal for a commercial development on the site if council were. So that's my understanding of that statement. And so is the planning process for that different? <laughs> through you, um, no, that would require a planning proposal um, submission to council. See, Councillor Corsi. Uh, yes, look, I just would like to say that um, as a councillor, I don't take kindly to threats um, that if the council doesn't do what the applicant is demanding we do, that they'll go and do something else. And I think it's completely inappropriate for a member of okay. the public to be doing that. Councillor Corsi, do you have a question? No. No. Okay. We'll leave that for the debate then. Okay, and next one is item 15.6, Mr Angus Gordon. Good evening, councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Let me begin by apologising for not making a submission on this matter. In early October, I went to hospital for what was meant to be a simple procedure. However, unfortunately, I ended up spending nearly two months in hospital. Many of you will know me as the uh, past general manager of Pitwater Council. Some will be aware I have a civil engineering degree and for over 50 years have been involved both nationally and internationally in coastal, flood and geotechnical engineering projects. For many people, the word conservation brings forward warm feelings about native animals and vegetation. Unfortunately, however, for me as an engineer, it brings hard professional concerns regarding the conservation of lives and property. In the old Pitwater LGA, around three quarters of the uh, properties are impacted by either or a combination of bushfire, landslip, flooding and coastal erosion. The area is very different to most of the old Warringah and Manly LGAs. For example, there is an order of magnitude more bushland subject to fire and threat to lives and property. Where the other LGAs are based on sandstone formations, in pit water outcrops of sandstone can fool people into thinking it's the same, but it isn't. The sandstone in pit water is perched, often precariously, on clay and slate formations both of which are quite unstable. That is why every now and again large boulders fall off headlands like Avalon or landslips threaten houses. Historically, Warrywood Valley, which was just being discussed, has been badly flooded. And the villages, uh, the villages of Newport and Avalon are very flood prone. They're actually built on old swamps. And that's not to mention the regions around Narrabeen Lagoon. In 1974, houses at Bill Gola collapsed into the surf 
And of course, all the foreshores of Pitwater are prone to erosion, as highlighted by the current threats to houses at Great Mackerel Beach. Recently, the Premier said that we could no longer afford to build in vulnerable areas, and yet that is exactly what our inept state planning system delivers. There are still thousands of people up north suffering from the floods of over a year ago. And on the south coast, we forget that there are people who still haven't recovered from the bushfires that occurred a lot longer ago. The problem is the planning system does not appropriately recognise these threats. The residential zones um, provisions simply call for consideration of hazards, which is a, um, in practice easy to sweep aside. That just leaves the conservation zone classification to enable appropriately managed development. I am aware that the, provision, the proposed changes in the zonings are based on technical studies. I'm sorry, but I find them wanting. It is apparent to me that there, in the course of all these studies, no one has actually got their heads around the cumulative total impacts, nor their in interdependence, nor the reasons behind the zones, and hence the actual magnitude of threat given the significant impacts on future of the community. I believe Thanks. the overall, the overall uh, com compounded impacts of these threats definitely needs revisiting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor De Luca. Thank you, Madam Acting Mayor, and I, I'm sure on behalf of all councillors, we extend our um, sympathy to Mr Angus Gordon OEM on his illness and it's glad to see that you've recovered and you're back at council. Just in relation to uh, Mr Gordon's comments about that studies are wanting and fail to address the issues of cumulative impact threats and compounded impact, is it possible that either the uh, Mr Gordon or council staff through you, uh, Mr CEO, address those three issues and actually identify for us some of those cumulative impacts, threats and compounded impacts? Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Yeah, yes, we can get that information for the council as well. Is it possible to get it tonight, seeing we're voting on it? Um, as I said, um, happy to get that information for the councillors. Okay, therefore, could I ask that question specifically through you, Madam Chair, to Mr Gordon, if he's willing to answer my questions, if he could please elucidate. Uh, in relation to his comment that the studies are wanting, could he also please outline why they're wanting and particularly... I have a point of order, Madam Chair. I believe code of meeting does not allow us to ask questions from members of the audience. I may to be the wrong, point of order, Madam ask, Acting I ask, Chair, um, it does. For a ruling. Uh, okay. You Thank can you. ask questions of the speaker. Thank you. Please note that for future because we've just wasted time, Councillor Manano Perez. Coming from you, I really admire no, that. No, I think you. you. So just back to Mr Gordon, uh, the eminent former General Manager of Pitwater. Do you need me to restate the questions or you're right? Thank you. No, Councillor DeLuca. Um, I can't remember when I've ever refused to work with Council to try to sort out issues. I'm more than happy to do it again. So could you please, though, outline, you stated that the studies were wanting. You also said that there was no cumulative impacts taken into consideration, that there were threats taken into consideration and compounded impacts. My question is, could you please elucidate on those comments? I think that that might take a lot of time tonight. I'm more than happy to do that, though, in consultation with the CEO. Okay, thank you. If, um, Madam Acting Chair, if I Councilor can, um, it's good to see you back on your feet, Angus, and hope you're well and well on the way. Uh, my, my question is, I know on 18 October last year, Council resolved that they would accept submissions beyond even the submission close, closing date, which was in December. So I'd, I'd welcome any submission you have, which probably goes to the questions that Councillor DeLuca was asking. Okay, um, can I please have Anna Monticelli up next? Good 
Good evening. I implore the Council to support Councillor Causey's motion and listen to the community who want, one, to strengthen the Pitwater environmental planning principles in a new LEPDCP with no loopholes, two, to implement Pitwater's DCP 6040 rule, a scenic protection area and character statements, three, create real biodiversity corridors and protect tree canopy, each to be upgraded to a high environmental value criteria. Four, to retain all C4 zoning in pit water. I urge councils to support Councillor Causey's motion to retain all pit water conservation zones or a strong and separate pit water LEP. Not because the people of Pittwater are special, but because the area is special. And this uniqueness supports community well-being and many small businesses that benefit from the hundreds of thousands of visitors that come to Pittwater each year. There must be a balance between environment and development. Unfortunately, under this council, there seems none. And Pittwater is critically close to environmental collapse. A prime example is the proposed conservation zones review with 3,613 properties have been mapped to be rezoned from C4 to residential, whereas Manly has only 54 and Warringah one, prompting Mayor Regan to say, I think we got it, I think we got the balance right. The question is, who, for who, sorry, uh, calling it a conservation proposal is blatant greenwashing. It is a developer's roadmap, not an environmental one. But even the rezoning review is complete, if, but even if the uh, rezoning review is completely scrapped, as it should be, there is the problem of enforcing proper codes and regulations and closing the loopholes in the current LEP that have made a mockery of the DA approval system. I, like many residents, spend many hours trying to police scandalous DAs, organizing forums, distributing pamphlets, door knocking, getting pamphlets signed and petitions, and we are tired of doing council's job. For instance, in February 2022, I took Louise Kerr, Head of Planning, Councillor Michael Genscher and Miranda Causey on a tour of the preposterous DA approval building sites in, P uh, in Palm Beach and Wild Beach, where entire cliffs were removed and not a single tree or blade of grass left. Anna, Yet the sites were all zoned environmentally sensitive. Your time is up, Anna. I move and for I, an do extension. we have a, a mover and a seconder for an extension? I'll move that way. Uh, moved Councillor DeLuca, seconded Councillor Gencher. Thank you. I asked Louise Kerr, how did these DAs get through? Sorry, Sorry to vote. All those in favour? Those against? Hang on, keep your hands up. Oh, Sorry. Oh, okay, all right. So, Councillor Walton, Councillor Bingham, Councillor Manano Perez, Councillor, uh, I'm trying to think of your last name, Glanville, Councillor. Sorry, Madam Acting Mayor, could we just recommit that because there's some confusion? Councillor Glanville. Okay, so could we. Okay, just, all right. So, we're doing it again. All those in favour, put your hands up. Okay, Councillor Glanville, Councillor Causey, uh, Councillor Amon, Councillor Gensha, Councillor DeLuca, Councillor <laughs> Krevlin, uh, Councillor Robins. Those against? It feels like I'm counting the same person twice here. Hang on. Okay, all right, so we're now putting your hands up against Councillor Walton, Councillor Bingham, Councillor Manano Perez, 
and Councillor Ivan and Councillor Bratton and myself. And that's carried. Can I start? I asked Louise Kerr, how did these DAs get through? I, I was eventually given the answer through merit. Please explain the environmental merit in obliterating the entire site and calling it merit. I challenge all the councillors to visit these sites and confirm these monsters should have been approved on merit. All this proves the current system doesn't work. The council blames the state government for this development madness. Yet, I've been told by a lawyer that there is no legislation that requires one LEP to cover multiple areas or any ministerial directive to that effect, which, brings, which begs the question, why is this rezoning proposed on such a biodiversity fragile peninsula? And why is the current LEP not enforced? My group, Pitwater Environmental Heritage, believes Pitwater deserves an Environmental Heritage Protection Statute as it has astonishing natural beauty and historic significance unlike anywhere else in Sydney, and it needs urgent forward-thinking protection. If the rules and building codes in place are specific and non-negotiable and adhered to, there would be no need for residents to spend time fighting with council. And Thank no you. need to stand here to have your say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Item 15.7. Um, Madam... Wendy Small... Oh, sorry. Just, Councillor Amon. Just a couple of questions. Um, under the draft conservation zone review, could staff just confirm the number of properties that went from conservation zone to an R zone? Through you, um, Deputy Chair, I don't have that detail in front of me for the entire local government area, but I can tell you for Pitwater Ward. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, and that was information that was contained in the um, memo that was distributed yes. to councillors last night. Um, so in relation to the C4 zone, so as exhibited, there were proposed to be 7,457 properties that were to be zoned conservation three or four, as opposed to... 9,335 properties that were to be zoned residential. Following the review of submissions... Can, can I... Can I? Sorry to interrupt you. So there was about a net loss of C zones of about 2,500? I think it was 3,630. 3,600, yeah. And, and so um, the submissions have been reviewed. And so with the motion that has just been well spoken to by Mr Gordon and um, Miss Monticelli, if that motion were adopted, um, we would revert to the current Pitwater LEP in relation to conservation zones. That's my understanding of reading it, yes. And so that would mean things go back to how they are now. So there's no loss of conservation zones across that Pitwater LEP area, they stay as it is under the motion which is on the business paper. Yes, that's correct. Um, however, the Conservation Zones was also proposing more um, mm. properties to be zoned C3 and C4. So, so my next question is, um, this week, councillors... Or it was, it was last week, wasn't it? The day's just meshed into one. Um, last week, councillors had a, um, a briefing whereby staff had reviewed the methodology which had been applied to Conservation Zones in Pitwater. <coughs> and following that review is there a net increase in protection for pit water um, as it stands if that methodology is adopted or version one of that methodology is adopted? Yes, there is. And so, so how many additional properties on top of those already subject to a C zone today, not um, if the review were, were adopted as it is, but how many additional properties would have a C zone protection under the version councils were briefed on the past week? Um, 827 more within the Pitwater 
local government area, um, and a total of 5,003 across the entire Northern Beaches local government area. So if, if those properties, some of those properties went to R zones, say those 827, they potentially could be subject to seniors housing applications under the relevant SEPs? No, they would be um, protected. It, so no, no, if they stayed as R zones. Yes, that's correct. And so if those 827 stayed as R zones, theoretically, if every single one of them became a senior's dwelling, then that could potentially be another four units of seniors housing in each of those 820, or subject to... Hypothetically. Hypothetically. Yes. So we could have an additional 3,200 dwellings on those 827 dwellings if we leave pit water as it is. That's right. So if we adopt the motion as proposed on the paper, and I appreciate it might be subject to amendment or moved slightly differently, pit water would have th potentially 3,200 more dwellings than it already has. Less the 827 yes. already allowed for on those sites. So the proposal councils were briefed on provides greater protection for pit water than is foreshadowed in the conservation zone review. That's correct. So by an order of 2,600 dwellings. Yes, Councillor so Amon. Thank you. Technically, um, the, we would be reducing the number of properties that, as they were exhibited, were proposed to be zoned R2. So we would be going from 3,630 dwellings proposed to be R2 down to 1,734, but at the same time, we're increasing the number of C3 and C4 properties by 827. So there's a net increase in environmental protection. Thank you. I think we'll move on, otherwise we're getting very close to debate, which we don't start at the moment. We're still in public address. So, so oh, sorry, excuse me, Councillor, oh, oh, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> I just have one question for Ms Kerr through you, please. Yeah, and one question. So, Ms Kerr, could you please confirm for us that there will still be a, with the new uh, modelling that you've done, that there will still be a loss of 1,734 properties from sea zones? That's correct. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're on to the next topic of item 15.7, which is Duffy's Forest Community Bridal Trail. Uh, Wendy Smallwood, would you please come down? Someone needs to turn on the microphone. Thank you, Deputy oh. Mayor and Councillors. I represent Duffy's Forest Residents and Terry Hills Progress Associations, and I'd like to talk about the history, economic benefit, and community connection to the Bridal Trail. The history, the Bridal Trail is seven kilometres long from Duffy's Forest Fire Station to the equestrian grounds near the Fire Control Centre of Monavale Road. It is a community asset which links the three major public arenas and 122 horse properties. Its origin is unclear. It started as an informal route connecting horse riders in the 60s. Currently, approximately 60% of properties in Duffy's Forest have significant equestrian infrastructure. 40, 44 horse establishments in Terry Hills alone, hundreds of horses board in these areas. There are two training establishments holding up to 40 horses, each located on the bridle trail. This area provides horse riding opportunities for people across Sydney. Four horse riding clubs, including the Pony Club, support the upgrade of the bridle trail as it is unsafe in its current condition. Council has recognised the importance of the equestrian community in the past by constructing, constructing the multi-use tunnel under Monavale Road when the Pony Club grounds were relocated. Also construction of three, the three main horse riding arenas which link the, are linked by the bridle trail. 
economic benefits. This horse riding community brings in revenue from outside the area and this should not be underestimated. Just one riding centre employs 39 staff. Horse riders, visitors purchase food and other supplies from the local shops. Employment and, and income are also generated through local veterinary services, horse feed merchants, salaries, riding schools and horse adjustment, just to mention a few. Community connection. Our focus is about supporting local families to have a safe place to walk with their children and dogs and ride their bikes and their ponies. Along with supporting a very large horse industry for local economy. We appreciate the works recently undertaken by Council for small sections of the trail. However, it needs a comprehensive review for further works to reinstate this all-weather bridal trail for the safety of this community. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Okay, next one up on the same topic, Paul Moore. Start when you're ready, Paul. Is that uh, working? Yep. yep. So further to Wendy's comments, I'm speaking on behalf of the Duffy's Forest Progress Association and also Terry Hills but also a, a wide cross-section of the community that supported this uh, proposal to cancel. I think yeah, the reality is we believe that uh, Terry Hills Duffy's Forest is quite unique in the Northern Beaches, you know, the horse community, the semi-rural nature, and the Bridal Trail is a unique feature you know, of that community. Unfortunately, what's happened over time is the asset has degraded. Uh, development, uh, lack of maintenance, and as Wendy alluded to, it has now reached a situation where it's not fit for purpose. And really the proposal we're putting uh, towards council is to make the bridal trail fit for purpose. And this really came to the fore uh, through COVID, uh, where obviously the importance of you know, people to be able to get out there and walk the trails. So it's not just horses, it's the you know, people taking their families, people taking their dogs, you know, um, uh, joggers, etc. And... With the rain event that we had last year, it really highlighted some structural issues, uh, the safety issue, and basically parts of the trail became unpassable. And we've provided pictures uh, to Council which highlights just how dangerous that had become. And to be honest, it's a miracle that we haven't had a serious accident. So not only are we uh, asking for Council support in making the bridal trail fit for purpose, uh, but also in addressing you know, these immediate uh, safety issues. Um, in terms of its cost, it's relatively a low capital uh, budget item, particularly in relation to the $460 million you know, capital budget that the council has alluded to on their website. Um, so we think we get enormous benefits for small cost. We're addressing safety issues. But importantly, it's going to preserve a uh, community asset that, as we say, is a very unique part, uh, part of the locality and uh, that's basically what we're seeking support for. So I'll conclude my comments here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Councillor Causey, you have a question? Oh, oh sorry. Okay. That's All right. Uh, then our last one is eight, item 18.3, the Manly Dam Link Trail <coughs> Boardwalk asked after read a statement. Mr Stephen Hancock writes, the massive popularity of Narrabeen Lagoon Track demonstrates the clear desire amongst local ratepayers for more quality walking tracks within a local bushland setting. Generally, walking and riding tracks at Manly Dam are poorly ma maintained and in a terrible condition, having been neglected for many years by council. Sustainable tracks like this plan and the current Narang walking track upgrade need to be applauded. We can't keep our head in the sand and ignore the booming user numbers of the dam. No one is suggesting a free-for-all to develop the park, but there is clear need for well-constructed and maintained walking and riding tracks. Manly Dam should be accessible to all, particularly injured and older veterans who the park is dedicated to. This boardwalk will generally expand the areas safely accessible to less able-bodied ratepayers. Current walking access to picnic area number three along the road is a danger to users as the narrow road places them in oncoming traffic with numerous blind corners. 
It's certainly not a safe or relaxing environment to walk with children. My sons have had several close calls on this stretch of road and as a result, despite li living nearby, often end up taking our car, which is ridiculous. I believe we should be encouraging less cars to enter the dam. Creating this boardwalk will enable families to walk and cycle safely to the largest picnic area. In fact, I believe the boardwalk should be continued all the way to picnic area four. The recent revised plans have reduced the width of the boardwalk, which is a mistake if the usage of Narrabeen Lagoon is anything to go by. Wheelchair users and mothers with double plans will struggle to pass each other with only a 1.8 metre wide boardwalk. Despite being described by some as being an area of untouched bush, for any area near the water, it's simply not the case, as is shown by photos of the construction of this man-made dam. The boomer NIMBYs of Save Manly Dam Bushland Group are effectively waging a war on local kids. First, it was opposing the much-needed upgrade of Manly Vale Public School. Then it was reducing the Manly Dam playground to a fraction of the awesome original council design. Now they want small kids to continue to walk amongst oncoming traffic and stop a safe footpath when enjoying the delights of Manly Dam. After much work from council, heritage listing was granted at their request, but clearly they feel no gratitude towards council as once more they try to stifle council plans. Northern Beaches Council's consultation processes seem to be very flawed and favour opposition and negativity. The boardwalk project was announced with much fanfare in the local press by the Mayor and numerous state MPs. Many supporters of this plan would have reasonably assumed it was a done deal and being constructed rather than still in flux and potentially being fatally compromised or cancelled. I believe politicians should wait until the plans have been fully approved before inviting the cameras around so it's clear where the project stands is at. I fully support the construction of this trail. Please build the boardwalk as originally planned so that all ratepayers can access this beautiful part of the beaches. Thank you, Karen. I love that you sped up there with the 30 second mark to get it all in. Change gears effortlessly. All right, that concludes public forum and public address. Exactly. Thank Mr. you, everybody. Mayor, yes. Uh, look, I'd just like to make an objection to that speech that um, the speaker, not the person reading the speech, but the person who wrote it, was quite derogatory about the Save Manny Dam uh, members who are actually a high, very committed group of people. And I, I just think it's inappropriate that we have people making these sorts of comments in public speeches. Thank you. We'll now move to items by to be resolved by exception. Uh, do I have a mover and a seconder? Councillors uh, Manano Perez and Councillor Bingham. That is for those in the gallery or following at home that we resolve to call out items for debate, otherwise they are adopted as printed with the exception of mayoral minutes and notices of motion, which will always be debated. So I have from <coughs> Councillor Walton 9.2 being, oh, sorry, I need to, sorry, I need to vote rather than we go into items by, I oh, know, I'll move for a second, sorry, 9.2, Councillor Walton, uh, myself, sorry, Councillor Nano Perez rather, um, 18.3 in confidential, Manly Dam Boardwalk. Myself on 18.5, response to soft plastics, and 18.7, group power purchase agreement um, in confidential also. Uh, any other councillors? Councillor Amon. 12.1. Um, Actually, Councillor Amon, I do apologise. You did have that one down before. Councillor Hines. Councillor Glanville. Can we call out 12.2? We can. And 18.6. Um, and I call out 18.1 as I have a conflict and so it can't be moved by exception. It, it can. can it it? Just, I just ask you to leave the chamber okay. before we adopt it, that's all. Right. So if you don't. Okay. Any further, councillors? Councillor Corsi? Uh, yes, I've already sent you some, I think, for 9.2, 12.9.2. Um, Dave Walton's got the one. Oh, it's going to be called out. Um, so 12.2, 13.1. So 12.2 is called out. And 13.1. Um, and uh, where is it? 18.3. That's, That's what we're being called. Yep. Thanks. Great. I now move that, Councillor Grattan. Nothing. Okay. I now move that. Thank you. For, thank you, Councillor Glenn. I was about to ask you. Don't have to ask you. Very diligent. Okay. 
We'll now adopt those items which wait for them to be on screen. There we go. Ready up. All those in favour? Any councillors against? No. Declare that carried. Thank you. Councillor Marano Perez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have a procedural motion, uh, which is complicated, so please bear with me, my fellow colleagues. Considering uh, that I, your mail minute has to be dealt in confidential, yep. and there's a couple of other issues that are quite urgent in confidential, also considering that there is quite a number of people in the audience that I'm assuming will be here for the Councillor Cozy notice of motion 15.6. My procedural motion proposes that we deal with 15.6 immediately, followed by all the confidential items, and followed by the reports, followed by the rest of the motions. Sounds like a good plan. I'll second that. Yeah. Councilor Raymond seconded. We'll now put that forth. We change the order of business governance. So it's 15.6. Procedural motion. Yep. If Uh, that is to deal with uh, item 18, sorry, notice of motion. 15.6. 15.6. Followed by confidential followed by items. confidential. Followed by reports. Sorry, that's okay. I'll just let them. Sorry. I've got it. I'm just waiting for however they want it to be presented by staff, by all confidential items. Do you want to list them specifically? Do you have to? Are they happy with that, Mr. Smith? That's fine. Yep, that's fine. Okay. Um, staff reports. Oh, Could I just oh, ask a yep. question, Mr. Mayor? Does that mean then we're ejecting the public due to the confidential session and then they would have to return for the notices of motion? Uh, yes, with the exception we're dealing with one of the notices of motions immediately, which is 15.6. Yeah, but that means they've got to go out, no. sign... No, 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 there's people in the gallery that aren't just here for 15.6. Yeah. Okay, so now we've got a procedural motion from Councillor Nano Perez moved by Councillor Amon, the order of items B, confidential ones followed by remaining staff reports. I assume that covers the all confidential ones as mayoral minutes, that's fine. So that's, yep. Sorry. We'll can now. I, can we'll I amend that? <laughs> without so the permission of Nano Perez and Amon, no, but you can ask. <laughs> okay, so. I, I mean, I obviously would like to have 15.6 um, dealt with so that anybody who wants to go home after that one can. Yeah. But I do think that we should, um, we should go through the other business in order so that anybody who wants to stay can stay and doesn't have to go away and wait for us to go through confidential. I, I think that's inappropriate. We, we, we that would be called debate. So unless Councillor Amon and Minara Perez wish to amend their procedural motion. Uh, not really, not really, Mr Mayor, because I do think that your mayoral minute should not be delayed. We do need to handle that today. So I know it's unfortunate, um, and, and I apologise for the people that are here for other motions, but you know, due to the nature of the mayoral minute, I think that needs to be handled expeditiously. Councillor Amon, then Councillor Glanville. You may, Councillor Glanville. Um, might I suggest that we deal with fifteen point six? And I wonder whether we also may have some people here still about the community bridal trail as well, or have they left? Okay. Um, might we deal with that one first and then might be go into confidential just for the mayoral minute and then resume on the rest of... <laughs> so, very responsive governance. That's fine. I think... So, ultimately, yes, you can do another procedural motion after item 15.6 to change the order of business again, should you wish to do so, is what uh, Councillor Armon uh, is saying, based on the, the gallery at the time. I, I just don't really want to move a motion which might exclude people from a meeting inadvertently who might otherwise wish to be here, because confidential will go... Confidential will go for a while, I can assure you that, so you'd be outside for quite a while if you wanted to come back for the, the greatest hits afterwards. 
Um, hey, get some dinner. So um. I, I can't second it as it is then, but I'm prepared to have 15.6 dealt with and then see what happens. Let's I go. have um, an alternate suggestion again. Always like to have solutions. Maybe is there, I don't think it's probably in the code of practice, but could we maybe have a show of hands from the audience whether they wish to stay beyond the 15.6 otherwise? Who's here for 15.6 and who is uh, who plans to leave after that? Me. Oh, sorry. So. All right, councillors, can we just move the procedural motion? All right. I think that my, my point was, I assume most of you are here for that one. I don't know who is here to watch other things. Councillor Glanville. Okay, so we're now going to move the procedural motion and as noted, you can move another one following item at any time. So councillors, we'll now move the procedural motion to do as printed on screen. I'm now putting that to the vote. All those in favour? Or Sorry, Councillor Walton, Councillor Glanville, Councillor Walton, Councillor Bingham, Councillor Gensham, myself, Councillor Hines, Councillor Crevelin, Councillor... Sorry, it's Councillor Corsi's hand up. Councillor Can Corsi's I be taken up as a seconder given I'm voting against, please? No, it's good if you're voting against. You're I'll, second I'll, vote I'd against. Ra I'd fine. rather, I'd rather Councillor not. Councillor Manano Perez and Councillor Ryman, were you voting for? Sorry, Councillor Ryman. Against. And Councillor Grattan. Okay. And Councillor DeLuca's against. Councillor Amon's against. Councillor Ryburn's against. Declare that carried. Item 15.6 will now jump to the. Mr Mayor, that resolution was actually out of order because there's no seconder to the original motion. Uh, there was a seconder. Chris Councillor Amon. Amon. Councillor Amon withdrew his seconder. Councillor Amon, did you formally withdraw your seconder or just vote against yourself? Okay, well then we'll, I will happily second the uh, item after Councillor Manano Perez to save you. Right, we'll now have the item 15.6 moved by Councillor Causey, seconded by... Councillor Glanville. <laughs> Councillor Glanville seconded it. Councillor Causey has moved it. Uh, moving it as printed, Councillor Causey? No, I updated this afternoon, so... What was the update for the benefit so of So the updates, the basic uh, updates were that I removed... Um, the second, um, where is it? Hang on. Remove the second point and um, Councillor Granville and I have substituted a new point five, I think. Yeah, new point, uh, point five, but that's now moves up to point four, I think. Yet the retainal controls has been replaced with the new one that I sent in. So I sent a new one to governance. That's on screen. This afternoon. Yes, the new four. So the former five has been replaced with the new four. And the original two has been removed. And... Um, just in the item about the heritage items, um, I've added a, um, a couple of words about, where is it, um, any subsequent heritage items that have come up since the amalgamation. So, so that's in paragraph, um, where is it, six, the new six. Mr Mayor, I didn't get an opportunity to see the the email and I'm just concerned that we can't tell the difference between one and the other. So can you maybe specify the words you've added, for example, and to when? Um, okay. To get my... Excuse me, Mayor. Could someone also email this to me? Because I can't read it on the screen. It's so small. Thanks, Councillor Grant. We'll do that right this very second. Uh, 
Okay. So basically, um, if you've got um, the motion in front of you, the new one, as I've said, I deleted the original point two. So now we begin, first point is acknowledge the overall purpose of the LEP and point two becomes retain all conservation zones. Um, deleted the original point five and instead inserted a new point four, build on the existing Pitwater DCP controls. And in point seven, because I've reordered the points, I've changed the points it refers to, and so it now refers to points two, three, four, and five. Mr. Mayor, um, considering we're talking about a fairly complex issue, would my colleagues agree to defer this for a while and, and maybe Council Corsi could get together with the staff over the break and, and, and come back with a you know, rewritten motion? Can I, uh, can, can I make another suggestion? Um, this, I, I, I agree with the sentiment of this motion. I really do. What I'm mindful of is we've got a CEO comment which um, we rarely see. Um, and I'm, I want us to get this right, and I don't know if we're going to be able to do it around the table. So I, I just query whether we have a briefing on how we can incorporate the sentiment of this motion, which I think we all agree with, into something that's not going to delay the LEP or prejudice its progression for years. Can um, I just raise a point sorry. of order? Councillor Dwight, we're going on. into debate. We're not going into debate yet. No, we are. No. And I think. Sorry, Councillor, there's no point of order. We're not going into debate. There's some councillors being very helpful, as they are wanting to do, and they're outlining their concerns. And before I decide whether or not we actually go into debate, help we that we do have a mover for and sorry, a mover and a seconder. We also have some significant changes that have been made that A, have not been communicated to all of us yet, that one councillor has already said that she can't read and she's waiting for that email to come through. Two councillors have so far put forward some helpful suggestions. Council Walton, I think, was about to do something similar and I'll make a comment at some stage and then we'll decide whether or not we go into debate or otherwise based on we have a live motion here. Councillor Walton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so we'd need advice from the CEO because um, a significant amount of advice has been provided. Uh, are you able to uh, provide proper commentary um, as a chief executive officer uh, response um, now based on these, these changes that have just been made? Mr. Mr. CEO, sorry, just turned you off. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd have to take advice from my Director of Planning, but I, I do see currency in Councillor Amor's suggestion of bringing it back to next Tuesday night's briefing session, so there's no delay um, in it, and then bringing that back to the Council so you can have a discussion about all these particular points. Um, as Councillor Amor said, it's rare that I make a comment, and make a comment as strong as I did, and there's, there's reasons for that, which I think we should discuss at a briefing session. Mr. Okay, Mayor, so as, as the one that moved for deferment, I'm very happy that I'm very happy to second uh, Councillor Raymond's suggestion. Before you, thank you. So, Mr. CEO, is it possible that, with the permission of the mover and seconder, to withdraw the motion and bring it back potentially to the next council meeting based on the comments you made, or should it be dealt with now sorry, that it's live? And the, sorry, can I just asking some clarification for all councillors and those watching, or been as moved and seconded, noting there's a potential for it to be deferred as a, an amendment. I just want to make sure I can provide Councillor Causey and Councillor Glamble with all options available to them. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You can only do that with the approval of Councillor Causey and Councillor Glamble uh, with their current motion to defer it to a briefing session to then bring it back to the next council meeting. Okay, so Councillor Causey and Councillor Glamble. So we can debate the motion now. That's first and foremost, as moved and seconded, and, and it's been, as you've mentioned, altered um, with some additional points. Um, we've had, you could potentially withdraw it and have it brought back to the next council meeting without any debate. You could go down the path of debate now, but you've heard from a couple of councillors the 
possibility that they are going to move a amendment to defer the item. And that's that's probably the three live options. And I guess the potential is to continue to debate the motion and see how far it goes. But it sounds like there's um, some agreement around the table to discuss this more at length given the changes. So the options are both yours and Councillor Glanville on were in your hands. Um, I just want this motion to go ahead. We've been discussing the issue of conservation zones for months now. Um, we frequently discuss far more significant changes to um, motions, notices of motions. Okay. So Councillor changed. Corner. I've removed one, um, one clause and we've rewritten another one but yep. to make it clear of what the intent was. So okay, I don't so see that. I've Sorry, heard I'm still you. still speaking. No, no, we're going to move this into debate. That's fine. So, Councillor Gosley, I've given you the options. You're welcome to now go straight into debate and explain the changes and then go for the... Then I'll start your three minutes once you've explained the changes and then we'll go... Then allow you to present your case. OK, so first of all, I want to thank all the Pickwater residents, including Angus Gordon, um, Jackie Scrooby, the independent candidate um, at the coming state election, and Labor candidate Geoffrey Quinn for attending tonight um, and speaking, some of them. Secondly, I'd like to acknowledge the staff's work towards the new Northern Beaches Local Environment Plan. I realise you're under pressure from the New South, new South Wales Government, but the community expects you to advocate for us. However, I also note staff have listened to Pitwater residents' calls for greater protections in their submissions to the draft conservation zones review. In new modelling, staff have indicated we would increase the former Pitwater Council or we could increase the former Pitwater Council areas combined C3, C4 zones from the current 9,731 to 10,551 by introducing foreshore scenic protection areas. That compares to the 7,457 proposed in the draft Conservation Zones Review. However, as pointed out earlier, we'd still lose 1,734 properties from this zone. It's important we retain these as well as confront increasing environmental hazards such as bushfire and sea level rise. So what I'm proposing on behalf of the community is a further increase in numbers of sea zones on those in the new modelling. The crux of the issue is that important criteria for sea zones have still not been given sufficient weighting. Because of their environmental function, wildlife corridors and tree canopy merit the same weighting as areas of significant biodiversity. Similarly, escarpments, steep slopes and foreshore scenic protection areas, considering their scenic value and, and hazard potential, should qualify for sea zones in their own right, rather than in combination with another feature. In a related issue, we haven't heard anything yet about heritage protection in Pitwater or anywhere else. We must protect our built and cultural heritage in the LEP, just as we do for our environment. So I'm calling for staff to pro provide a report on heritage features. Whilst the CEO considers this motion premature, talking about a possible change or measures we are investigating does not reassure the public. The community wants certainty on this issue. But this isn't limited to Pitwater Ward. Residents across the LGA say environmental protection is their top priority. At a recent Pitwater planning forum, leaders of residents' groups from Palm Beach to Eleanora supported motions to retain the former Pitwater sea zones and upgrade protections in the LEP. The community is also concerned about transparency. And while staff have promised submissions to, review, to provide submissions that have been um, exhibited online, um, they haven't guaranteed they'll provide a response before the draft LP, LEP is exhibited. And finally, I note, as mentioned before, there's no legislation or ministerial directive requiring the council to have a single LEP. So it's not possible to, in a, in a harmonised LEP, to provide the former Pitwater Council area with, with the protections the community expects, then let's update and retain a separate Pitwater LEP. Thank you, Councillor Causey. Councillor Glanville, would you wish to add anything as a seconder of the motion? I'll reserve my right. Okay, yokes. Councillor Amon, Councillor Bingham. And Councillor Causey, could you turn your microphone off, Just please, so I can grab all of this? Thank you. Um, may I ask some questions, Mr Mayor? Yep. And I think perhaps the best way to do this is address each paragraph one at a time. Mm -hmm. um, in respect of 
paragraph one, um, if council were to resolve to adopt that, will there be any delay or prejudice to the process that we're undertaking already? Ms. Kerr. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, we've always stated from the outset that obviously the new LEP, we will ensure that we have the highest environmental standards because we understand that the environment is important to the community. Yep. Um, so that is in line with it. My only concern would be it talking about the overall purpose. An LEP does more than zone land. It also deals with other matters that are relevant for development across a local government area. So but, but even if it says overall, is that going to change how you or the organisation discharges its statutory no. obligations? No. Okay. Um, in respect of paragraph two, um, is that is that a lawful process insofar as um, we need to go through an evidence-based model or approach to how we zone things? Can we just can can we say that we're going to keep all those zones as they are? Can we just do that um, arbitrarily, or will that get through the department, or how would we do something to that effect? Um, my advice would be no. You wouldn't be able to do what was proposed in the motion. Um, it would affect the LEP process going forward. It would be established by others um, that council had um, predetermined its outcome. Um, in relation to the zoning of land. So so that would be, for example, if council was assessing a planning proposal before you even went through the statutory process of addressing um, environmental impact, traffic, safety, accessibility, etc. If you just said, we're not going to accept this, then we're fed at our discretion or we're, we're prejudged and therefore we're not That's properly correct. discharging our duties. Yeah. Okay, so two, we can put the side as a problem. Um, three include any properties with recognised biodiversity, tree canopy, dot, dot, dot. Um, there's no prejudice if we adopt that, is there? That's we I presume doing that anyway. Um, through you, Mr. Mr. Mayor, um, that would be a change to the methodology that council endorsed at the August of um, last year's council meeting um, and staff haven't been provided an opportunity to provide further information for the councils to make an informed decision on that but, basis. But, but uh, isn't item three somewhat, um, it's meaningless insofar as it doesn't actually say, well, what kind of biodiversity or what kind of tree canopy? It doesn't actually specify. So how can that actually meaningfully mm -hmm. impact how you assess conservation zones? Because it doesn't say, well, what degree of flood or what degree of coastal erosion or land? So how, how does that actually impact how you do things? Um, it's the methodology and the values that have been assigned which form part of the con conservation zones methodology. So as council will be aware, there were a value assigned to those hazards and environmental criteria. So, yeah, okay. So the, the, there's a word missing from paragraph three, which is values, because it doesn't say properties with recognised biodiversity so on so on values it just says recognize biodiversity recognize tree canopy recognized corridors it so it doesn't actually have the word values in there is that, is that what i'm missing that paragraph three doesn't reference values that's correct okay so then paragraph three as it is because it doesn't have the word values isn't it just it's not going to affect how you do your work on it is it it doesn't, and so the technical studies that Council has prepared include information on this, but how you assign a proposed zone is dependent on the value you assign those particular um, aspects and studies. Okay. Then moving on to paragraph four, um, I, d does this have an impact on the work that the organisation will do in terms of... because? Where I understand we've been going from all our discussions is we've been seeking to strengthen the enforceability and various conservation of nature and tree canopy controls anyway. So does paragraph four um, have an impact on what we're trying to achieve anyway? Um, not technically. Um, however, where we do believe, so the way it's worded, it would mean that we need to retain all of the pit water current controls and build on those. If there were some through our review that we thought weren't delivering a good environmental outcome in the assessment of development applications, then it may be our recommendation to abandon that control as part of the LEP. What we are seeking to do, as councillor are aware, is to include more of the development controls into the LEP 
and a particular one that I'll call out is the landscape area control. Mm. That 60-40 control does not currently sit in the LEP, rather it's a DCP control. So <coughs> paragraph four as it is may weaken our planning controls in pit water. It if it doesn't allow us to yes. remove some planning controls That's which right. are problematic. Okay. Paragraph five. Is that going to impact in terms of, I know we're looking at foreshore scenic protection areas already, um, excavations we're looking at, removal or destruction of significant rocks and cliffs, I don't know if we're looking at that. We are looking at that, as well as removal of buildings, spoil from development. So five can stay as it is and that won't impact the work we're doing. Okay. Um, paragraph six, that's going to happen anyway. Heritage items is just going to be dealt with in the process, isn't it? Or is this a separate thing? Um, so the proposal for the LEP going forward is for obviously all the existing um, heritage items in the four LEPs to obviously come across into the new Northern Beaches Local Environmental Plan. Given the extent of potential heritage items, my recommendation to the council would not to be include potential heritage items because of the controversial um, nature that they often have within the community, particularly landowners, that may um, cause a delay to the local environmental plan. It would be our recommendation that we would do that as a phase one, um, as the first amendment to the new Northern Beaches. LP. When you say proposed heritage items, paragraph six only references um, nominated that they be, that nominated heritage items at the time of council amalgamations be considered that's those that aren't currently listed so the community um over time can write or make representations to council expressing an interest for a property to be explored for its heritage conservation so um nominated um is my understanding is of those that are on a list waiting for further examination <laughs> okay Paragraph seven is, um, what are the, um, at the end of this process, um, we will have a draft Northern Beaches LEP. Um, if we went to the Department of Planning, irrespective of who's in government, with three separate or four separate LEPs, which is what we currently have, are they just gonna knock it back, holus bolus, or is there a possibility that they might accept different LEPs for different parts of the LGA. Try now. <laughs> um, that would need to be a question put to the Department of Planning. Um, I'm not aware of any um, amalgamated council that currently operates under multiple LEPs that are not going through a process um, of amalgamation and having one consolidated LEP. Thank you. Um, and then paragraph eight, that's going to happen anyway. That's correct. And we are about to put all submissions on the website and including a consultation report as we've committed to councillors. So paragraphs one, five and eight of the motion pose no difficulty. Paragraphs two, three, four, six and seven do. Um, but I think, based on the advice, we can probably reword some of them, being two, three, four, six, and seven, so that they capture, I think, the intent of what we're trying to achieve, but by not prejudicing the process. That's a statement, not a question, sorry. So my, my question is, if we adopt this motion as it is, what does that look like in terms of, um, this has been effectively a, from amalgamation May 2016 to date, so, seven year process effectively. If we adopted this motion as it is, um, can you give an indication of what that does to the timeline of adopting one or four different LEPs moving forward? In its current form, it would significantly delay a new so LEP. So what's our, what's our current, what, are we, what time are we currently aiming for to have an LEP, one LEP done by? Um, we're aiming to get a draft LEP to the council by the end of this year. Um, hopefully with a recommendation to go to gateway determination with an exhibition that would occur following gateway determination in 2024. So mid to late 2024 would be looking to have something signed off. We would hope. Yeah, we can always hope. Um, but this would delay things for an unknown period of time. Is there a risk that a state government 
takes away our planning powers like happened in Karingai and then says we are... So for, let's say, for example, a new government who says we want to review housing targets on Northern Beaches, be it, let's say, for example, a Labor government says we want to review them, Northern Beaches Council doesn't have... At Northern Beaches doesn't have an LEP in place. They come in and say, we're going to do it for you. They up the zone Brookvale, they up the zone Narrabeen, they up the zone Monavale, they up the zone Newport, they up the zone Terry Hills, they up the zone Manly, because we haven't done our job. Is that a, is that a possibility if we're delinquent in discharging these things on a timely basis? Um, it is a possibility. Um, all councils are required to have local environmental plans that are consistent with objectives in um, the district plans and their local um, strategic planning statements and housing strategies. Um, and so the longer we do not have a comprehensive LEP, we become inconsistent with those um, high-level strategic documents. Um, and so one of the... Spe Ms. Ms Monticelli raised some developments, specific developments, although she didn't name them, but we know what... I mean, she, she's raised them with us previously, which I thank her. Um, they, they arise from um, issues residents have with the current development control plan, um, which has controls which are basically current, inadequate in the current um, construction the way construction is done, they're inadequate. So, for example, we don't have a, um, a, a an excavation control, for example. And so um, if we delay this process by, and I'd say, another five years, developments can continue to occur under the old Pitwater, current Pitwater LEP and DCP, which are leading to the adverse outcomes which are causing anxiety in the community. So, effectively, we're going to be allowing these developments to happen for the next five years so we can ex explore or go through this proposed process if it were adopted. That's correct. We'll continue to assess the DAs under the current And so controls. if we... And, councillors, thank you for bearing with me. I appreciate it. This is very dry. Um, and so if we... Um, if we adopted this motion, as I referenced earlier, um, we would have an extra overall... Yes, there would be some properties that go from C zone to R zone, but on an overall basis in pit water, we would have an additional... Instead of having, I think, um, say, just under 10,000 C-zone properties in Pitwater, we would have just over 10,000 C-zone properties in Pitwater, being an increase of 827. So if we adopt this motion, we will have more residential zones and less C-zones in Pitwater than if we explore what we're now talking about in Council. So we will have 800 more R zones in pit water um, if we... Sorry, I'd like to interject Sorry. because I think Councillor Amon is misrepresenting the motion and the um, what I've actually explained about the motion. And the actual fact this is talking about an increase and not a decrease in conservation zones. I accept the modelling that the staff have done and presented to us last week, but... The community wants all of Pitwater's conservation zones to be maintained, and the reason is that they have significant uh, biodiversity issues with um, wildlife corridors and tree canopy, yep. and then there are also issues with the escarpments and steep, um, steep land. So You've made your point of order to a, to a point, but Councillor Amon is asking questions to each one, which well, is fine, as he's right to do. To be misrepresenting he's, what I'm saying no, and what this motion says. No, he's been asking very specific questions, and on that one, he the staff have pulled him up to say, I'm not quite sure, and asked for an additional clarification from him. So if, if, we, if we adopted this motion, and so specifically... Paragraph 2 says that we retain all existing conservation zones in Pitwater, which conceptually I agree with. If that were to happen, we would have 9,000, I think, nine to 10,000 sea zones in Pitwater. If we went down the route we're now looking at around this table, which we had in the room up there the other day, we would have 800 more sea zones in Pitwater than we currently have. So... Would over yes yes some properties I take Councillor Causey's point some properties would go from C zone to R zone that's uncontroversial in terms of the facts that's just a fact um, but overall we would have greater protection amongst properties because more properties would be C zone than are currently C zone. I'm sorry, that's this correct. is still misrepresenting what the motion says. Um, no, the sorry, motion Councillor does not Causey. exclude Councillor the modelling that um, Louise Kerr sorry. 
Ms Kerr has carried out. You'll have a right of reply. Okay, Councillor, any further questions before I pass to other councillors? No, no, thank you. Sir. I do. Okay, we have Councillor Walton, Councillor Bingham, and Councillor DeLuca, in that order. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to move a procedural motion uh, to defer this item to a briefing next Tuesday. It's a very important item um, and based on the substantive changes, in my view, to the notice of motion, and based on the feedback from the CEO in relation to a proper response from the CEO with regard to the substantive changes to the motion and how they impact on the strategic policy developments that we have in place, um, I'd, li I'd like to move that um, uh, procedural amendment. motion to defer. That's okay. That's an amendment, not a procedural motion. It's okay. So. Okay, thank you. We've had the Council Walton move that we defer the matter to Tuesday night's briefing. And do I have a seconder for that? Yeah. Councillor Manano Perez, thank you. Um, Councillor Walton, did you wish to add anything further to that amendment? No, nothing further, thank you. Okay, and that's the, oh, the, the Just matter acknowledging the importance of this yep. and uh, that we do get it properly aligned uh, to, our, to our strategic uh, planning policies around the the LEP and DCP in particular. I think that point's been made. Okay, thank you. Any further people? Yes. We've got Councillor Bingham, then Councillor DeLuca. Uh, my questions have been answered, thank you. Councillor DeLuca. Thank you. I'll speak against the amendment in that I commend councillors, Councillor Causey for bringing this matter before the chamber. It is clear that it is a significant issue that the people of Pittwater or the former Pittwater Ward or LGA have serious and significant concerns about. In the string poll earlier, residents stated that they would prefer for this matter to be dealt with tonight. This has been democratically and legitimately put on the agenda. In relation to Clause 2, if it is out of order, it can either be changed or reworded. And I just think by delaying does give a unfortunate perception to the community that we are not dealing and responding urgently to the concerns that they have legitimately raised and that Councillor Causey has raised. So therefore, I would encourage all councillors to vote against the amendment of deferral because this will mean it will not come until the next council meeting. So there is a month delay. And I think from what we've heard already, the issues that were outlined by Councillor Amon. Most of the clauses, and I don't mean to verbal you, but I took it that Councillor Amon was relatively in favour of varying clauses. However, raised issue as to the wording of two. He said one's okay, three's okay, four you have exception to, five perhaps okay, and then six not seven question mark and eight was okay. So if a majority of the people at award councillors have clearly said that a majority of the matters before the chair tonight are okay to proceed, I don't understand why then we're deferring it. Thank you, Councillor uh, Manana Perez and Councillor Amon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a question through the CEO to possibly to the Director of Planning, Ms. Kerr. Uh, if we def choose to defer it for a briefing next meeting, uh, next week, and uh, the next council meeting, will that have an impact on the timetable you described as far as our LEP is concerned? Ms. Kerr. Uh, through you, um, Mr. Mayor, um, no, that wouldn't affect the timing. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. Okay. Any further comments? Oh, Councillor Ramon, sorry, you did 
but you're no, that's right. okay. I, I was just going to say, um, just on Councillor DeLuca's um, reflection on my questions, um, the, the the comments I made on the paragraphs are not necessarily my view. It's just what I think can be achieved and what can't be achieved in current form. Conceptually, I'm su I'm supportive of what Councillor Cause is trying to do. Um, but I'll also make the point that the Pitt Water Ward also includes um, uh, councillors Robins and, and um, Crevellan and yourself in terms of from Mona Vale down to Narrabeen. So that, that is also caught up in this as well. Um, so it's not just what the three amigos here want. Um, it's also, also your residents are impacted too. Um, so I, I just wanted to respond to that, that um, your remarks on that. Okay, now if we've got no further speakers, I'll just may put the amendment to the vote that we defer the matter to a briefing on Tuesday, the 7th of March. Okay. Those in favour? Councillor Glanville, Councillor Walton, Councillor Bingham, Councillor Gensham, myself, Councillor Hines, Councillor Grattan, Councillor Crevelin, Councillor Robins, Councillor Manano Perez, Councillor Ryburn, those against? Councillor Amon, Councillor Causey, and Councillor Delica, and oh, welcome to Councillor Sprott. <laughs> Declare that carried. That now becomes the. I'm oh, sorry. Oh. Councillor, thank you. That's right. Amon was against. Councillor Amon was against. Councillor Deluca was against. And Councillor Causey. There we go. Thank you, Councillor Thank you. That becomes the motion that the item be deferred. There's no further debate. I'll now put that to the vote then to formalise it and then we'll move to procedural motion to go to confidential. Okay, councillors, we now have that as a that to defer the matter. Those in favour, we'll just wait for everyone's screen so we can vote. Just governance. We're just waiting for governance to put it on screen so we can vote for... Sorry, Councillor Robin, yes. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Can I just add a comment um, for those in the audience who perhaps don't know what actually happens at a briefing? And I want to just make sure that a briefing doesn't just sound like a hocus-pocus way that we're siding, um, or siphoning rather off a really important matter such as the one that's before us tonight. Um, and often it's, it's hours of deep work looking at specific examples, looking at terminology, ways we can restructure notices of motion um, with the staff. Um, it is thorough and, um, and it's important to note that so that um, it is not felt or left unsaid um, that this is something that um, we are deferring so that it can be tied up with um, other matters and forgotten. That's certainly not the intention of this um, of the uh, amendment, which is now the motion, um, and that's also why I'm, I'm voting in favour for this. Right, now, I just saw that on street, but where was it on the... It was on the screen then? Governance? That's not... There's no vote. We're waiting for the vote. There's nothing on the screen. Okay. Sorry, I'd also Councillors. I'd like to speak against the new motion. I'll, I'll put the motion. Sorry, I gave amendment. the opportunity, Council Causey. So now we're at the point. So I haven't had an opportunity to speak against the amendment. Yeah, we have. I gave you an opportunity to speak against the amendment, and I gave you an opportunity prior to putting the motion. I was waiting for governors to put it on screen. Not Councillor, since this was passed as a motion, uh, this as an amendment. We did, and you can watch the replay later. But you know what? For the sake of it, have the floor. Okay, so I just want to make the point that the, um, there's already been a lot of work on this motion. Um, not only has Councillor Glanville had a look, she's advised me about some of the issues with it, but I've also had a, an extremely experienced, um, a, another extremely experienced planning and environment lawyer with many, many years on council as a councillor in another area look at this. And so this isn't something that was just came off the top of my head. So I do acknowledge um, that um, we do, the briefings are important, but this was partly a response to a briefing. So 
um, and the fact that in that briefing we were told that the issues that this addresses um, would not be um, changed. So, um, so I do welcome the opportunity, I guess, in that sense, that if we do have another briefing, maybe those issues will be reconsidered. But this is not a motion that um, was Ill, Ill thought out. OK, we're now going to put that motion forward. That's the right of reply. OK. No, sorry. There was a right of reply from the original mover of the motion. But now to vision, just wait for it on screen. Right. The matter be deferred to the council briefing. Those in favour? Councillors Glanville, Councillors Walton, Councillor Bingham, Councillor Gensham, myself, Councillor Hines, Councillor Sprott, Councillor Crevelin, Councillor Robins, Councillor Manano Perez, Councillor Robert, and Councillor Grattan. Those against? Councillor Amon, Councillor DeLuca, Councillor Causey. Declare that carried. Thank you. We have a procedural motion that we move into a break because as per the, as per the code of meeting practice, it's 8 o'clock. It's past 8 o'clock. Do I have a second to move into procedural? Councillor Amon, thank you. <laughs> I'll just wait for it to be on screen. As per the agenda meeting, I'll do. Uh, the 10 minutes. Those in favour? Nobody against? Declare that carried. Thank you.
Governance, you're ready to go. You're ready to go, IT. Okay, we've got eight councillors here. All right, councillors, we now move back into and we've moved a procedural motion earlier whereby we move the order of business. Uh, we've dealt with item 15.6. Um, we now move another procedural motion to move into closed session to deal with those items in confidential. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Hines. Thank you, Councillor Bingham. For the reasons in front of me on, on the screen is why we are moving into confidential. I will now vote on that item. All those in favour? Councillors Glanville, Councillors Walton, Councillor Bingham, Causey, Gencham, myself, Councillor Hines, Councillor DeLuca, Councillor Crevelin, Councillor Ryburn, nobody against, declare that carried. There are councillors absent in that we don't have councillor or now ask that the staff can move. I don't think Grattan's back, Councillor Grattan. Yeah, I can't see Councillor Grattan on my screen and I can't see Councillor Robins. I don't think I can see Councilman Arno Perez. There it is.
done. Plus two, I know. It's great. No, you're not good. I'm sorry. Please let me know. Let's wait for you all ready. Yeah, you're all right. You're live now? We're live now. Okay. Governance, just let me know when you're ready. All right, so we're now, I'm just waiting for governance to give me the all clear to start rolling through the items passed in confidential. Uh, which one's item? Item 19.8 is uh, the resignation of the CEO uh, on behalf of the council, Ray, and councillors of the body, who've, all of which are probably going to say something over the next five or ten minutes. Uh, it's been a pleasure and an honour, and thank you for your extraordinary service. Thank you for putting us in the right direction. Thank you for putting a great team together. Thank you for your contributions, in particular during COVID. It's been an absolute uh, amazing experience being working alongside you since day one, uh, and particularly during COVID when we uh, had to navigate something that was quite serious and unknown. Uh, you and the carried uh, the executive and the staff and brought the community along and the elected body along. So I can't thank you enough for that contribution. Uh, I look forward to seeing you succeed in the future. And again, on behalf of the Northern Beaches community, well done and thank you for your outstanding service. Deputy Mayor. We're going around the table, are we? Um, I would also just like to echo um, the Mayor's comments. Uh, we certainly needed someone to bring together a, um, a, a partly amalgamated organisation and we were looking for someone at the time who was a change maker and who could knit together the rest of the organisation to um, bring it to a, a point where we could feel that a lot of it was being completed. You not only did that, you actually... Um, reimagined the organisation as we had put that challenge to you. And I think you've addressed those challenges um, extraordinarily well. Um, you have one thing that I think um, that's been brilliant is that you've loved going out and meeting our communities um, who have responded really well. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure working for you and I hope we see you soon again. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Grattan, whilst you're alive online and we can hear the voice of God from above. <laughs> is it that loud, is it? It really is. Um, thank you so much, Ray. You've made an extraordinary difference to this organisation. I've really appreciated your wisdom, your balance, your the vision that you've had and bringing the organisation together managing sort of all of the behind the scenes, the, the risk management, the resilience and so forth. Um, we're in a much, much better place and you've left us somewhere where we can go on to the next thing knowing the foundation has been built and has been very strong. Um, and personally, I've very much enjoyed getting to know you and working with you and the amazing team that you've built around you. So we are forever in your debt. Thank you. Right, Councillor Ryburn, I know you wish to say something, so I'm going to throw it to you now before you fall asleep down there. 
Oh, I have, I have, my haiku hasn't yet um, been completed. But I can't, do you want me to come I'll, back to you? <laughs> no, I'll send it to you later. Um, no, I, I echo what's been um, already said, um, particularly as, as new councillors around the table, I think um, sometimes uh, we take for granted um, the, the benefit of, of coming in with things that are well communicated, um, as well as um, always being a CEO who is... Um, responsive to us and and helpful and so we've really appreciated that um, and you'll be sorely missed in this organisation. Other councillors, I'm not sure, Councillor Bingham. Just quickly because I know everybody's getting tired but couldn't let the moment pass. Ray, you have been magnificent. I've worked with um, a number of other general managers and I have to say you are by far the best. You came highly recommended and you did not disappoint and I think one of the things that's really... Um, work for us beside the fact that you put together a fantastic team of directors for us who I know will carry things through with great um, regard is, is just the, the integrity that you brought to the role so um, I really appreciate that and want to thank you. Thank you Councillor Bingham. Councillors? Councillor Gentry then Councillor Walton. Uh, Ray I, I can I'm, I'm sure you can but I can clearly recall our very first conversation um, and, and to be honest from the start to now uh, your generous uh, and nature, spirit, heart, and mind have been great counsel. I look forward to you going to Randwick so that we can actually become friends. Um, I really have appreciated all the good counsel, the mentoring that's gone on, and my two oldest sons have a problem with their DA in Randwick. So <laughs> we'll talk. Thank you, Ray. Thank Councilor you. Walton. Um, congratulations, Ray. Uh, played tough, done good. Being a rugby league uh, boy and a Piermont boy, you have done very well. So uh, <laughs> thanks very much, and uh, obviously we'll keep in touch. Other councillors, I don't want to miss out. Councillor Manana Perez. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Right, just briefly, uh, congratulations. Uh, I'm sorry to see you go because I, I would have liked to continue working with you for, for, for the rest of this mandate. I, I, I think we only worked together 12 months. However... I have to say something. I mean, having gone through um, the IAG and the beginning of the amalgamation with uh, with with uh, Mr. Regan D, and having had a break, and then kind of coming back to <coughs> the Northern Beaches Council and finding the organisation I did, I for one realised the enormous task that you took upon yourself and how well you did in the four years, three and a half or four years that you were here. So um, uh, I congratulate you for that. I know it wasn't easy and um, I wish you all the best in the future and who knows, uh, small world, maybe we'll work together again. So thank you, Ray, for everything. Thank you, Councillor Sprott, Councillor Robins. Um, yeah, Ray, um, I think that you have been the keel of a very unstable boat when you, uh, when you first arrived. Um, and you managed to bring together the team. You brought staff together. You brought this, this council together, and you made a huge difference to uh, the way things happened around here, which I appreciate, um, and I'm sure others have appreciated as well. Um, I think you've set us all up from scratch, which was a huge task, and uh, I thank you for that. And I know that the community and staff thank you for the... Um, the systems that you have put in place for us to go forward. I wish you all the best at your new role in Ramwick. Um, it's a shame that you're leaving, but, you know, I understand why. And like Gensha, I will be joining you for that lunch. <laughs> um, it's a when, lunch? Uh, yeah, and it's your shout too. Apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks. Thanks, um, right, Councillor Robins. Uh, yes, Ray, I remember meeting you in uh, December 14 months or so ago in our very first meeting. Um, I very much appreciated your quiet and um, very kind sense of humour over that discussion we've had. And um, congratulations on your new role. Um, I don't quite know why you're leaving the Northern Beaches. I still haven't got that. I'm sure um, you've made the right decision for yourself and your family, so all the very best with that. Thank you for the little bit of mentoring. I look forward to keeping in contact after um, or in the future, and all the very best. Thank you, Councillor Grappling. Mr CEO, we will miss you. Um, I 
can't thank you enough for all your help. Um, starting as a new councillor was very, very daunting. Council was a huge beast. Um, but having you there was really helpful and um, your mentorship, your guidance, um, your friendship was has, it has proved invaluable um, from the bottom of my heart and probably from everyone else's. Thank you very much. Any final comments before we go? Councillor Raymond. Yeah. Um, thank you. Mr CEO or Ray, um, I think the one of the real tests um, or measures of your success was when you first started um, the Pitwater community as rambunctious uh, as it can be, uh, very much wanted to secede um, and become its own nation state in many respects or at least demalgamate. And I know since that time um, you were able to turn that around um, to a point where none of the resident groups support a demalgamation, um, none of the resident groups want a demalgamation, um, that I know of anyway. And so I think that's a real mark of your success. Um, you have turned, from my perspective anyway, um, an organisation where I felt there was a low trust environment between the councillors and, and parts of staff to a high trust uh, environment between councillors and staff. And I think, again, that's a testament to your success in that role. And I think from a personal level, um, you have provided me with guidance and advice, um, never unsolicited um, and always gratefully received as well. Um, and so for that, I thank you and I wish you all the best uh, when you or as you go back to Randwick and no doubt um, the drives might be a little bit uh, less taxing upon you. So I wish you all the best. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. I think that concludes. There's no other ones lining up, so thank you. Can I just ask now staff, just to government staff, just to roll up to point two, then point three, then point four of the mineral minute, just so we make sure we've done this lawfully. Slowly, oh, sorry, my screen's not moving. This one is. Okay, um, Council Forming Knowledge, just around this, if you can yeah, let's go to three. Council doing appointment of Derwent as the external consultant. Keep going. Um, the Mayor, Deputy Mayor, four other counts, councillors, yep, keep going. Councillor, two of the members of the selection panel will be myself, the Deputy Mayor, Councillor Robins, Councillor Roburn, Councillor Causey, Councillor Walton, moving on. Moving on. Oh, that's it, it's, just, it's general staff, keep going, that's fine. That's fine, keep going. Right, next item on the confidential was, I think, 18 point. Then point one. Thank you. Uh, item point two. Thank you. Item eighteen point three. Or if you need to continue the other way, it's fine as long as you. Okay, just go back up again for a second. Just have to be at the top there in accordance with. It's with okay, thank you. Just scroll down. Can Great. I just show the against? Yep, continue, continue, and then point four is it four? Mr. Mayor, the amendment wasn't clearly shown. Oh, we're not showing the amendment, we're just showing what was, what was adopted. That's all. Except the tenders, thank you. Next. 18.5. Keep going. Thank you. Next, 18.6. Thank you, 18.7. Great. 
Thank you very much. Now I'll move a procedural motion that we extend the meeting um, by 30 minutes to 11.30. You've got the words there, governance. A quick point of clarification. Don't you words. have to move that before 10.30 or is it before 11? Before 11. Okay, thanks. You wish. So just, just wait for it. It's myself and Councillor Hines. Of course, the time limit has been extended by 30 minutes. Thank you. I now move that procedural motion. I can vote against this. All those in favour? Yeah. Councillors, what? We're making a procedural motion. Councillors? Okay. Oh, All that's to extend the meeting by 30 minutes. Councillor Walton, Councillor Causey, myself, Councillor Hines, and great. Those against? <laughs> Councillor Glanville, <laughs> Councillor Bingham, Councillor Gensher, Councillor Deluga, Councillor Sprott, Councillor. Um, Crevelin, Councillor Robins, Councillor Manana Perez, and Councillor Ryburn, and Councillor Grattan. <laughs> Councillor Amon is in favour of extending, declare that lost. Fantastic. Right. <laughs> Councillors, we'll now go to item 9.2. Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief, Mr. Mayor. So, um, I'll be second it. This uh, half-year performance result from the 1st of July to the 31st of December is an excellent result. Uh, we're on track for a forecast 7.4 million surplus from continuing operations. Sorry, could I just pause? Are you coming down here or staying up there? Staying up there. Councillor okay. Council Walton? Yep, for the, from this... Um, so uh, 7.4 million surplus from continuing operations for this financial year. Uh, so on top of this, we're on track to increase capital expenditure to 108 million, uh, thanks to some timely grants from the New South Wales government. Uh, this result comes from income returning to normal, uh, some user charges and fees increasing and in increasing grants and contributions, but more important, is the slowing of the growth in expenditure. Our growth in expenditure has slowed to below growth in income. Finally, um, this is the real proof of merger, uh, the merger achieving efficiencies and economies of scale. We are seeing some positive results from our service reviews and reduced levels of bureaucracy in the organisational structure that's saving money and improving decision making by bringing the decision making closer to the services uh, areas, but that flattening of the structure. Uh, and we're seeing those savings. Um, these are all decisions that should have been made whilst council was under administration. However, we're getting there under the uh, outgoing CEO. But this is a, a, an ex excellent result. Um, so we should remember that rates uh, only increased by 3.7% this financial year, and that's almost half the rate of inflation, uh, with some councillors predicting this to be a disaster. However, this is proof that we uh, do not have to continually increase rates above inflation if we run this organisation efficiently and stop the waste. So finally, I'd like to thank the CEO and his team for delivering a real financial dividend to the Northern Beaches ratepayers with the help of the IPART rate peg this financial year. Uh, this real cut in rates this financial year will be Council's part in easing cost of living pressures that many of our community are feeling. Um, money the community can spend uh, better on their families. So let's keep up the scrutiny of our expenditure and ensure that it's not wasteful and 100% focused on the community and uh, not on whims of councillors. Thank you. That's the best farewell speech you've ever had, Mr CEO. <laughs> All right. Any further comments, questions, Councillor yes. DeLuca? Thank you. In relation to the comments about rate rises by uh, Councillor Walton, could I please be advised for each LGA area since amalgamation, the annual increase for each LGA, former LGA area, so Manly, Warringah and Pitwater, if any? The percentage increases for each. Mr CEO, try now. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Yes, we'll get that information for you, Councillor. 
Thank you. And in relation to other revenue, lower income sources, including parking fines, uh, 0.8. Could I please have a breakdown in past years of the actual parking fines, uh, the amount each year? Is that reduced? And if so, uh, what has um, been the main reasons for such reduction? And then with other fines, does that relate to building compliance or mainly dogs, ranges, fines? What does that include? Yes, is it here? Thank you, Mr. Moon. We'll get that information from the council. In relation to grant funding from the state government, sorry, I did see it, grants. Is it possible to get a clear outline since amalgamation exactly every year the total amount of grants provided by the New South Wales government since amalgamation? Mr CEO. Yes, we can provide that information, Mr Mayor. Thank you. That's all. Uh, Councillor Sprott. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if on the uh, investment page you've got the... Um, uh, the expiry date or the, the date that it matures, the maturity date. Could we also have the date that you invested? Mr. CEO. Oh, the, sorry. Sorry, okay. Well, can we have again ahead? Can we have that for the next one then? Save me saying it again, please. Thanks. Okay. Councillor Causey. Um, I just want to make a couple of quick observations. I was going to say more, but um, I, I'm not so excited about the $7 million um, surplus, but um, because we still have um, all sorts of problems in the area. I mean, there are all sorts of issues. The weaving, I mean, it's actually mentioned in the paper that um, there are a number of positions to fill, environmental compliance we know is very weak, um, development um, compliance I think is another issue. Um, there's all sorts of infrastructure that we need. Um, so we know, for example, since I've joined Council, footpaths in Avalon and Mona Vale remain in a very poor state. We've got rock pools in pit water that are crumbling, um, and local halls needing more work. Um, the other issue that I'd just like to raise concerning the grants and the Stronger Communities grants in particular, which of course are coming to an end, um, is that they've been very strongly directed towards um, sporting facilities. So they've gone to Monavale Surf Club, Long Reef Surf Club, Newport Surf Life Saving Club. Well, that's a, a much smaller amount, but um, that that is nowhere. We're going to need a lot more than that to sort out. Newport Surf Club, netball courts, um, whereas things like the Monoval Performing Arts Centre has had 2.2 million, and I think I added up somewhere that total for sports facilities was 8.28 million, while arts centres have got 3.07 million. And of course, the Wakehurst Parkway, which we still have problems with, um, the former council um, supported the, the closure of uh, Monoval and Manly Hospitals. We've now got a hospital up at... Um... Sorry, just, uh, just a yep. Well, uh, question. When did Northern Beaches Council support the closure of Monovale Hospital? And has Monovale Hospital actually closed, given it's still Monovale Hospital? I, I was the on the Monavale, Save Monovale Hospital Committee, and we wrote to the council, and I think I had responses from two councils at the time, and we asked for support from the council... Um, to um, oppose the closure of the emergency and acute services Monavale Hospital. Pitwater Community now has a hospital that... Can you point to a resolution where this chamber, in whatever no, form I at whatever can't... time, said we support X, Y or Z happening in Monavale? OK, you fa the, the former council failed to support the community when it requested support in opposing the closure of... Which, uh, which council? Emergency and... Um, well, which, which council? Sorry, I'm still speaking. Sorry, can we talk about the relevance here? Talk about the quarterly review? The relevance is that 
Wakehurst Parkway is getting $1.01 million and that will be nowhere near enough to uh, flood proof that road and particularly in an environmentally sensitive way. So what I'm pointing out is that there are serious issues that um, we need to deal with. This is the state and government the road, Wakehurst point, Parkway. Excuse me, I'm speaking. Sorry, but this is the state, you're talking about Wakehurst Parkway, the state government road. Yes, and the okay. council is also um, actively participating in fixing that road. With the grant that we've been given. So that there are still significant um, shortcomings in our infrastructure here and staff shortages. And I believe that um, we are going to have to be very careful um, when it comes to our budgeting process to ensure, well, to balance how we... Um, fulfil these needs and where we find the money. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? Nope. I'll now put this to the vote. All those in favour? Nobody against? Declare that carried. And at 11.04pm, I close the meeting. Your last one, Mr CEO. Thanks for coming.